God bless everybody. Christ is risen one last time before the end of the Paschal season. Tonight, we will be addressing in our Orthodox Extended, Orthodox Ethos Extended podcast, many, as many as we can get to in an hour and a half, practical matters of our spiritual life for those who are struggling and Orthodox for years and for those who are new, catechumens and even for inquirers. We're glad you joined us, and we hope tonight's session will be very helpful, very practical, down to earth and also insightful in certain ways, perhaps, that you've not considered. And so we're going to be giving a little bit of the theoretical background, of course, to a lot of what we'll talk about tonight, but most of it will be focused on the practical day-to-day spiritual struggle. How do we live? How do we act? How do we uh, go deeper? So let's get right into it and bring up our uh, image on the screen here, how to guide, a practical guide to orthodoxy. Uh, again, we obviously cannot address uh, everything that, you, that we're going to be living as orthodox Christians, but we can get into the, a lot of the basics, how to commune, how to confess, uh, how to do koleva. This is some of the things we're going to be discussing tonight. As always, our aim here at Orthodox Ethos is to follow the Holy Fathers. Now, the, a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about today doesn't necessarily have some uh, great patristic treaties written about it, but it's coming down to us from the holy tradition. We're taking it from our fathers in the faith. We're talking also about our own experience a bit uh, close to the holy mountain of Athos and around the fathers uh, in the monasteries uh, in America uh, in, in, and in the contemporary elders that we uh, follow, that we knew. Uh, and so hopefully this will be uh, an insight into uh, the contemporary Orthodox struggle for a lot of Orthodox Christians. But always, and in everything, we seek, as you see here, to follow the Holy Fathers. And only in this way can we come to know the truth uh, of the gospel and the life in Christ it, it, as, it's, as it is lived and ha- passed down by the Holy Fathers. So the first thing we're going to address tonight is, again, it's going to be a lot of basic stuff. Some of you will be like, oh, I already knew this, but that's all right. We'll double down, we'll go back, we'll, we'll refresh, and we can help others who may have not considered these things uh, previously. Uh, before we go further, let me just say again, your questions are welcome, especially tonight. I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions and uh, things I won't cover, and that's fine. That's, I'm looking forward to your questions as much as I can help you on those other practical issues that I cannot address in the time allotted to me. You are welcome to submit your questions. Now, if you're in uh, c- coming to us through Facebook or uh, YouTube, you can uh, uh, flag there uh, my uh, good friend and assistant here tonight, uh, John, uh, and just uh, say, uh, you know, all caps, question for Father Peter. And he will uh, save those and, and, and tag me on those at the end so that we'll, we'll get your questions. And if you don't, hear the your questions at the end submit again and try your try it that way uh if you're over at crowdcast as usual uh as usual we will be taking your questions and if we don't get to them tonight we'll get to them on thursday which also leads me to remind everybody as well as our newcomers especially that we are uh, every Thursday together with all of the patreon crowd all of the OE Orthodox ethos uh patrons supporters over at uh, uh, crowdcast we're uh, every thursday 5 p.m fielding your questions and i think and most uh, thursdays we're between 30 and 40 questions we try to get to and at least give a basic answer so if you have questions more questions about the orthodox faith more questions about life in christ then uh, by all means uh join us every thursday over at patreon that's a patreon.com slash F-R-P-E-T-E-R-H-E-E-R-S. Uh, and join us there. You can give uh, $1 a month if you like. I really don't care. But that's the patron platform that we're using. We are hoping in the near future to begin the process finally of getting everything under the Orthodox Ethos umbrella 
so that we can have a membership site uh, and everything can be much better organized than we are able to do right now uh, through Patreon. So, Patreon. So, you know, join us. And then when we transition over to the Orthodox Ethos uh, membership site, it should be a, a no brainer for everybody. All right. So the first topic uh, we are going to address tonight is the basic sign of the cross. Now, if you're a inquirer or a Protestant or someone who has been uh, led to believe that this is some error and should be thrown aside, we have St. Cyril of Jerusalem from the fourth century who gives us a witness from early Christians as to how important the sign of the cross was and had already been well established, obviously, from the times of the apostles. So uh, that is uh, what we'll, we'll lead with. Let me just want to make sure that everybody is connected. We're looking at a poor connection for some reason on my end, and I hope that we're not having problems. But if we are, John, let me know. Give me a little heads up here in the in the private chat so I uh, I know that uh, you know things are things need to be looked at. All right. So how to make the sign of the cross? Well. There is the Orthodox way, and then there's other ways done by uh, non-Orthodox in the West, especially. So it's important for people to understand not only the how, but the symbolism as well. Uh, but first, let's hear from St. Cyril. He says, let us not then be ashamed to confess the crucified. Be the cross our seal made with boldness by our fingers on our brow and on everything over the bread we eat and the cups we drink, in our comings in and our goings out. Before our sleep, when we lie down, when we rise up, we are in the way, when we are still. Let the cross be there continually on everything. I think a lot of us probably limit the sign of the cross to, I shouldn't say a lot, but I think this is unfortunately a practice among some, who are less in, aware, maybe less zealous, they keep the sign of the cross only for the time in church, or maybe when they go by a church, or maybe just when they're saying a prayer. But you can see here that the saint is saying, everything you do, let the sign of the cross go before you and bless it. Great is that preservative. It is without price for the sake of the poor, without toil for the sick, since it is also, it is also, since also its grace is from God. It is the sign of the faithful, the dread of the devils. For he triumphed over them in it, having made a show of them openly. For when they see the cross, they are reminded of the crucified. And they are afraid of him who, are bru who bruised the heads of the dragon, despised not the seal, the sign of the cross, because of the freedness of the gift, out for this, the rather honor your benefactor. So this is an honor to our benefactor. It is a dread of devils. It is a sign that we are belong to Christ, the crucified one. It is a tragedy, a great tragedy, that we have millions of people who call the name of Christ but neglect and even disdain the sign of the cross. How that came to be is a long story. Uh, it is undoubtedly through uh, a scandal uh, uh, that they fell into the trap of. In other words, turn away as people who call themselves Christians to turn away from the sign of the crucified one can't be but a di diabolical trap and a terrible development. Now, how do we make it physically as Orthodox Christians? Obviously, we take uh, our hand, as you see on the screen here, and we have the symbolism. We have the three, which are, that's actually showing, yeah, the three, that's correct, three who then indicate the Holy Trinity, and the two here they indicate the, the human and divine natures of Jesus Christ. And we make the sign of the cross from the brow to the chest to the right and then to the left. In the, in the West, of course, they make it in a different manner. Uh, so this is the way the Orthodox make the sign of the cross. You can see here in the symbolism. Uh, the, uh, the the sketch below, how it needs to be all the way down and all the way across. Some people who have not been properly initiated or properly formed 
they make it very haphazardly. And you can see this especially among people who are kind of culturally orthodox. They just kind of play, as we say, the banjo or something with it, which is not a good idea because you're not showing respect. You're not actually showing that you are a faithful and who understands the power and the and the and the implication and the uh, the the symbolism of the Holy Cross. So if you're going to do it, do it right, and don't have the demons laughing at you because you have no respect for the very sign that you said that you are supposedly honoring. But if you do it in a haphazard way, a thoughtless way, without prayer, without concentration, well, then uh, you're you're uh, not uh, going to get the benefit uh, and you're not going to honor the benefactor as St. Cyril says. And by the way, there are many quotes that we could bring up, bring up from the ancient church. St. John of Damascus has quite a bit on the sign of the cross and, uh, but this should suffice for us tonight. So that's our first little foreway into the sign of the cross. What about the candles? These are going to be all Again, tonight we're looking at practical matters, but a little bit of theory, but mostly practical issues. So again, if you have issues, questions, this is the night to bring them up. If you have thoughts about different practices that you've seen, you don't understand, uh, start, you know, write down your questions and send them along. Why do we light candles? St. Simeon of Thessalonica, the great liturgist from the 14th century, uh, has this to say. And there are different symbolic interpretations. We'll give you two tonight. As the candle is pure, and of course we're talking about pure beeswax, one of the problems we have in the modern world is because we have this ability to basically fabricate things that were pure and blessed and going back generations upon generations with various uh, modern uh, technology. We have the uh, paraffin, uh, the, the, the fake beeswax from, from uh, oil, from, uh, from, from a, a non-pure, uh, let's say, uh, source, uh, which doesn't have the symbolism that you're going to hear. So this is, we're talking about pure beeswax, right? There is a meaning, there's depth to this. It's it's not uh, just uh, an accident that we use the pure beeswax. So as the candle is pure, so also should our hearts be. So this is going to be symbolic, uh, but also real, right? This, this is pointing to the reality that we all need to live. It's it's a symbol, an external that points us to the internal. So as you see the pure beeswax, you should think about the purity that your soul and your heart needs to be. And as the pure candle is supple, as opposed to the paraffin, so also should our souls be supple until it, we make it straight and firm in the gospel. In other words, supple meaning soft and receptive to the word of God, to the shaping uh, in the spiritual life. Uh, uh, by our Lord, who's constantly reshaping and shaping us and teaching us uh, how to live. So that's another example. As the pure candle is derived from the pollen of a flower and has a sweet scent, paraffin does not have a sweet scent, so also should our souls have the sweet aroma of divine grace. As the candle, when it burns, mixes with and feeds the flame, so also we can struggle to achieve Theosis, mixing with the divine grace, becoming one with God, God's by grace, God's by grace, as the great St. Athanasius teaches us. And as the Lord himself says, ye are God's by grace, by his uh, restoration of our image and likeness, right? So this is the theosis. This is what theosis means, to be restored to his image and likeness and to be continually in communion with him. As, number five, the burning candle illuminates the darkness, so must the light of Christ within us shine before men, that God's name be glorified. So another message here, when we look at the pure beeswax candle, that this burning candle illuminates the darkness, so should we. So should we, if we are in Christ, illuminate the darkness by our life and our words and our example. And as the candle gives its own light to illuminate a person in the darkness, so also must the light of the virtues, the light of love and peace, characterize a Christian. The wax that melts symbolizes the flame of our love for our fellow men. Did you ever think that there was so much symbolism in a simple candle? Have you paid attention? The fathers saw much in every little thing that the Lord has passed down to us in the holy tradition. 
Now, here's a reflection of my own, which you can take it or leave it. It's not worth that much, but uh, it does seem to jive with what the saints say. So that's why I'll offer it to you. When I was, I remember when I was visiting just after, not long after my baptism, some 26 years ago, uh, I was visiting uh, the monastery in Essex. And I remember thinking about the candle that was burning there. And as a symbol of my life, and that the Lord who has been ignited in me and has brought his grace and the flame of his divine energies is burning away all of the sins and passions of the old man. And the whole process of my life is that I decrease and the, and the light increases, and that the sins and the passions are burned away. And yet what's brought forth is the light of Christ by that burning away until finally the life is over and the candle is burned down. And what remains is only Christ. That's the goal for us all. So a short reflection for what it's worth. St. Nicodemus the Hagurite tells us the same and gives us the following symbolism, tells us more of the same and the following symbolism. To glorify God. Why do we light candles? To glorify God, who is light. As we chant in the doxology, glory to God who has shown forth the light. To dissolve the darkness of the night and to banish away the fear which is brought on by the darkness. To manifest the inner joy of our soul. To bestow honor to the saints of our faith, imitating the early Christians of the first centuries who lit candles at the tombs of the martyrs. To symbolize our good works, the Lord said, let your light show shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in the heavens. The priest also gave us this charge following our baptism. So everyone who's baptized in the Orthodox Church hears this charge. This is what we should be. And of course, the light that shines is not ours. It's not us, but it's Christ in us. He and the works that he brings about, when we decrease and he increases, that's what's glorified and that's what is seen before men. He and only him and through us and uh, in, with our synergy, our cooperation. And finally, to have our own sins forgiven and burned away as well as the sins of those for whom we pray. So lighting candles has always been a, a part of the life of the church. It is something that was obviously practical, not only symbolic. Over time, the church, through its experience, sees and attributes much to the practical life and, to, and for, for us to always see Christ and for Christ to be all in all. But obviously, there's many practical things that the church was doing uh, from the get-go. Lighting candles would have been an obvious one. Having oil lamps would have been an obvious one. That was the only way, of course, the church was lit. And so that practical need is not seen simply on the horizontal plane, so to speak, only as a human effort, but is seen as now taking on a divine human real, uh, significance and seeing Christ in everything and seeing the symbolism, which is not any less real. Some people think, well, symbolism is just something made up or something. Actually, it's pointing us and is a part of the reality of things. How do we greet an Orthodox priest or bishop? How do we greet an Orthodox priest or bishop? How do we receive a blessing? Because that's how you greet. When you greet an Orthodox priest or bishop, immediately you're not just before someone who will say hello and shake your hand, but you're before someone who is in the place and uh, represents a type of Christ. And that's part of what it means to be ordained, to become a priest according to Christ, the order, as it says, the order of Melchizedek. He is the, he is the high priest, and we participate, and we, our hands now become his hands, and we essentially are standing in, and he's doing everything through us. And so those hands of the priest uh, that bring forth the holy gifts in the holy altar, but bring forth the blessing and the good word from heaven, those hands are to be respected by every Orthodox Christian. So we approach with reverence to every priest we meet, 
not because of the sinful priest, obviously, but because of the the role that he plays in our salvation and the representation that he has. So how do you do it practically? Then we'll look at the other theoretical uh, understanding of why we kiss the priest's hand. But first of all, what are we doing? We approach the priest. Here's an, here's an image, by the way, not of a priest, but of a monk, the great Saint Paisios. But you see even the people were overcome with love for him and they would kiss his hand, which is a norm in the Christian society. We'll talk about that in a second. So you cup your hands in front of you. Take your hands and you put them together like this and you cup them and put them in front of you out and you extend them to the priest. You place, place your right hand over your left. You turn your palms to face upward. You approach the priest. You bow slightly at the waist and say, Father or Master, if it's a bishop, bless or your blessing. As we're saying Greek, tinefisas, your blessing, your, 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 uh, or, uh, or just bless, evlogite. Asking for a blessing lets the priest or bishop know that you wish to greet him and he will bless you with the sign of the cross. Again, everywhere and always the sign of the cross. Extend his hand to you and place it in your cupped palms. And so in some cases, um, in some cases, we have in the Russian uh, tradition, we have um, this is a second, uh, a more a more formal, let's say, slightly more formal than the Greek, uh, where the priest will make the sign over you as you make the sign over yourself, just in the same way. So from your forehead to your chest and across the way, and then he will put his hand in your hands for you to kiss his hand. In the Greeks. Uh, practice, day-to-day -day practice, you don't see such, perhaps, such formality. Um, uh, and so it's more just a very quick that, you know. And so not a, not a big difference, but a little less formal. You kiss the back of the priest or bishop's hand. This kiss serves as both a greeting and an acceptance of the blessing the priest or bishop has given you. And by the way, that's something that would happen both on seeing the priest or bishop and then departing from the priest or bishop. That's how you greet him in both ways. And you would, you would do it uh, departing and coming, ask his blessing. So let's talk about that. Why do we do that? You can see here on the left in the corner uh, that we have that little symbol of how the priest normally would give his hand. And so he makes this symbol here and this you can see you can see this is the yota the i and the c or sigma and then the he and then the sigma again what does that stand for Jesus christos jesus christ so even when the priest is blessing it's it's all about christ christ is blessing he's the one who's giving the blessing from god through the priest and so even in the way that the hand is formed, we're pointing to Christ. Everything Christ all in all and everything we do. So you can see here just what we mentioned before. The bishop is coming and the, and the man is coming to get the blessing. Uh, and he's extended his hands and the priest has put his hand or the bishop has put his hand in his and he kisses the hand. Now, kissing the hand of a priest is not an exceptional thing. Whereas in the West, unfortunately, because it fell out, it lost touch because of their Rebellion against holy tradition, unfortunately, it became exceptional for people to kiss one another's hands. But that's not the way it was. It even, of course, is up to this day in many Orthodox lands, but certainly would have been far more common across the whole world. Uh, that is a sign of respect and, uh, and communion. So it's a remnant of what was once a perfectly normal custom, showing reverence to our elders by kissing their right hands. The kissing of the hand was the normal and expected way to show reverence not only to the clergy, but the parents, grandparents, godparents, and others in authority over us or holding a revered position in our lives. So far from being some kind of clericalism, this would have happened across the board. In fact, I lived this in the village where people would go to the older generation on big feast days, the people meaning the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they would pass by the grandfather or grandmother and always kiss the hand before communion. So this was not something reserved just to the priest. In fact, 
in many places, in my experience, in the old country, in Greece, in the villages, they'll kiss the hand of the presbytera, the matushka, as well. So it's not reserved only for the priest. But how much more for the priest who has is the type and the place of Christ in the community and brings the blessing of the priesthood. So it's not something strange at all. It's the Christian norm. The disappearance of this custom is part of the disintegration of traditional Christian society, which was based on hierarchy, humility, and respect. And based, of course, on love, which does not exist without respect. So far from being some kind of diversion from Christ, it's a fulfillment of the love and respect for Christ in our neighbor and in our uh, those who have authority over us. And that is very much basic to the Christian outlook on life. It's a hierarchical and very much a question of, um, uh, of order. Uh, the older generations that, that come before us, the respect we pay to them to, to receive and pass on the life and the tradition of the church. When we kiss the hand of the bishop or priest, we are not showing respect to the person of the priest, but to his sacred office. I would say that I would change this slightly and say we're doing both, actually, because we, we're doing it across the board with grandmothers and grandfathers. But it is far more important in the priest's case that we that we understand it as going to the higher. Just like when we kiss an icon, we don't kiss and venerate, per se, the wood or the paint. It's not where the honor goes, not where the respect goes, not where the veneration goes, but to the person that's depicted. Same thing here. The, the priest is an icon. He's a image of... Christ in the community through the passing on of the, the priesthood, the apostolic succession. That's how God wants it. That's how Christ ordained it. He said that that which you bound on, bind on earth will be bound in heaven. He's the one who gave them the ability, the, the apostles and all the succession of the apostles of, uh, of this power uh, and, and the, the, the power for sins to be for, forgiven, not through the apostle, priest, or bishop, of course, but Christ working through it in his church. So obviously the priest is a sinner like all of us, uh, but he represents Christ. He's an icon of Christ. And though his hand is unworthy, yet it touches the most holy things, the precious body and blood of our Lord. Furthermore, despite his unworthiness, in holy ordination, he has received the grace of God to impart spiritual gifts and blessings. Why would we deprive ourselves of the blessings of the Lord himself by not seeking the priest's blessing? That's a question all of us who are still hung up uh, in a Protestant prison of rationalism and yet trying to become Orthodox, trying to embrace the tradition, trying to crucify the old man and the intellect and the rationalism. We need to ask that question. Why are we doing this? Why are we depriving ourselves of blessings? You can be sure that every attempt to be humble, every desire to humble ourselves before Christ and the person of the priest will not go unrewarded and will all be transferred to Christ himself. So when would we ask for a blessing? Again, a little repetitive here, but just to read the card entirely, we typically seek his blessing whenever we greet and bid farewell to our spiritual fathers. We kiss the right hands when we receive the prayer of absolution at confession or at other prayers. But during Holy Communion, obviously, we're not going to kiss his hand because then we have the Holy Chalice, and that's not the time to kiss his hand. Now, a little, a few words on ecclesiastical etiquette in church. Ecclesiastical etiquette in church. These are just select matters. There's much more that one could talk about. And of course, if you're new, if you're a catechumen, if you're an inquirer, if you're somebody who doesn't know a lot and still learning, uh, you'll have to go to your spiritual father, your priest, your bishop, whatever, and learn more. So I'm just touching the surface, some of the more problematic perhaps in our society. So first and foremost, we must arrive on time to church. Now you might say, well, that's kind of obvious, Father. But unfortunately, it's not obvious. In many places in the Orthodox Church, there is this tendency to go late to church among certain groups, I won't name names, and that is to their own spiritual detriment, and it's also a sign of less than the greatest respect for the Holy Liturgy and not 
having the zeal to want to be in the temple of God and pray. We should struggle to go from the very beginning of the divine services and only when we have some serious obstacles. For instance, you're a mother, you have five children, for instance. Okay, obviously, we understand there are exceptions to every rule, but as a rule, if you have no obstacle, then you should be there at the beginning. You aim to be there at least for the Matins gospel. If it's a, if divine liturgy is preceded by Matins on Sunday morning, as it is in most churches, except uh, in the Russian uh, tradition, we have the vigil service on most feasts and and and, uh, and Sundays. So we're doing Vespers and Matins Saturday night. That could be three, four hours, depending on how extensive the, the service is. Uh, and so you have those combined. They're on Saturday night. and But then you're going to be going. You're going to be struggling to go to the whole of Vespers and the whole of Matins on Saturday night. Very important and very good to do. Very beneficial spiritually. To uh, no matter if you have the vigil service or not, to be uh, there in church on Saturday night or before the feast day for Vespers, very important spiritually if you're going to make progress. It's not there. Unfortunately, there's this idea. Well, I just go in the morning. Not the best. Not going to make a lot of progress spiritually by doing that. Now, uh, if you begin your Sunday with Vespers, five or six o'clock at night seven, whatever it is, and you spend the next 24 hours mindful, prayerful, celebrating the Feast of the Resurrection every Sunday, your whole week will be blessed, your whole day will be blessed, of course, and you will make much more progress than if you end up uh, showing up at church late on Sunday morning. Well, you're going, whatever you give, you'll get. You know, If you invest little, you'll have a small investment in return. So the best is to go from the beginning of Matins, at least get there by the Matins Gospel. Do not walk into church after the Evlogimeni, the blessed is the kingdom. It's not going to be the way to do it. Uh, as a rule of thumb, don't commune if you have not arrived by the Gospel. Put that as a basic rule. That's the extreme. Now, if you have a good reason, obviously, that you have been forced not to get there because there's been a car accident or there's been some just some reason that's out of your control, well, that's a different case, right? There are always exceptions. However, if you choose to go late and then approach the Holy Mysteries with that kind of approach to divine liturgy, the benefit is going to be limited. You may even have a negative uh return on your investment. Put down some basic rules. I will not approach the Holy Mysteries if I'm not there. If I have children, I'm going to make an effort to get there before the gospel. This is a basic rule. It, obviously, it'd be much better if you go from the beginning of Matins, much better if you get there before the gospel Matins, much better if you get by the doxology of Matins. All of it is an increase in your, your investment and therefore your return. And so you're only going to be serving your salvation. But this should be, at least there should be some basic minimum that you put. And you say, I'm not going to commune if I don't do X, Y, Z. Now, we'll talk about how to prepare for communion in a little bit. But this should be uh, a wake-up call to anybody who walks in and, and still approaches the... I, as a priest, I would not allow people who came after gospel to commune. Uh, if I, if there was any reason that I knew or saw or somehow people, some of my church wardens told me this person, I would say, do not commune. I would not commune them. and. People really didn't like that, but that was a way to wake them up and help them to get serious about the higher things in life. And I hope that I helped somebody. I don't know. Maybe they just got angry. It's possible. It's their choice, right? It's their choice. But I, as a priest, am charged to protect and guard the holy mysteries. It is my role to be faithful to that, uh, that uh, uh, what, what I was given at ordination. And so. There has to be some basic boundaries here or we're going to lose control. And that's often what happens in some places. So God help us. Never cross your legs in the church. Never, ever, ever cross your legs in church. You might say, well, what's the big deal about crossing legs? It is a sign of disrespect in the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox countries. And it is just far too casual for the Holy Temple. It's not a serious position. Crossing legs does send a message that I'm just hanging out here, I'm spending time, I'm 
Maybe I'll, I'll have a coffee here shortly. That's not how you comport yourself in the Holy Temple. The way we're in the Holy Temple is we're in fear and trembling and love and devotion and prayer and mindfulness and watchfulness over ourselves. Sitting and crossing your leg is a sign of the opposite. So beyond that, in many Orthodox countries, simply crossing your leg at any time in some places is a no-no. So how much more in the temple? You won't see that happening in an Orthodox country. And if it is happening, that's another sign of disintegration. So maybe that's a total news to a lot of you because the orth the uh, culture we live in doesn't uh, see anything wrong with that, of course. But that is how it is in the traditional Orthodox uh, country and, and way uh, of, uh, of living and, and moving within the temple. If your baby cries excessively and in, and goes on for a long time, take him out of the holy temple until he calms down. There are some people who have this idea, no matter what happens, I will stay in the temple because this is my father's house and, we've, and there's, there's absolutely truth to that and we're at ease and we're not, people move around, people venerate, people go in and out. I, that's not always the best, but we're, in orthodoxy, we're not caught up on a lot of that. We don't have pews. We shouldn't in the holy temple. And therefore, there's movement. There's people venerating. There's people coming. There's people, you know, doing whatever they need to do. So on the one hand, babies crying is not a problem in the orthodox church. But if it's excessive, if it's the distraction that goes on for an extended time, then now you have, you have need to depart and let people pray and let people be attentive and don't stay in the temple until maybe you know they the baby is able to calm down so take the baby out until he calms down then come back with a calm baby another these are just hit and miss there's a lot of things we could talk about i'm just giving you a few things that i think are a little more necessary stay until the dismissal do not depart after holy communion unless there's some service that you're going to to give to the church you might have to go and prepare something in the alt in the in the hall, you might have some other thing to do with the meal. Fine. Anybody who has a blessing to depart, they can depart. But if you have no blessing, you have no other work, you're not supposed to be anywhere else but in the temple, stay until the end. Even if you have not communed, obviously you're going to stay in that case to receive andidron, right? Andidron is that bread that's been blessed over the holy gifts in the holy altar by the priest and is given out to all those who do not commune. So number six, receive andideron only if you have not communed. Do not receive andideron if you have communed. In Russian churches, thankfully, they've maintained the so-called zapivka, which is simple bread and wine with a lot of water, warm water, which they take after communion, those who commune, simply to wash down the Holy Communion. That's not andidron, that's not blessed bread in the same way that the andidron is blessed. And it's not, of course, anything like communion. So it's it, it's taken by those who have communed. Obviously, if that's the case, there's no reason for you to go up. If you're in a Russian tradition and you do the zapivka, which I think is an ancient tradition that the Greeks unfortunately got rid of or haven't continued among the faithful, among the lady, it's still done in the in the altar by the priest, but it's not. it's been stopped for whatever reason among the lady. It should be returned. It's a good thing to come back to every Orthodox church. That's how the priests do it in the altar. They don't take andideron. They take blessed bread, or ble bread rather, whether it's andideron or not, it doesn't matter, but it's usually not. And the um, the uh, wine and uh, and the uh, zeon, which is the hot water that's used, that's boiled and used uh, in the communion. So they have leftover Zeon, which is not blessed, they drink that along with wine, and that's how they just like there's a pifka for the lay people. So that if you if you've been commute, you've communed, you don't take and did now. You might say in some Greek churches or places they don't have Zapivka, and so they give out and did on to those who've commuted. Fine. That's a situation where uh they're giving it out as as if it's in the place of something like Zapivka. It's not at the end. When the priest gives it out, it's right after communion, or it should be. But at the end of the divine liturgy, when Andiron has been given out, 
it's given to those who could have but did not commune. So that goes to number seven. And Dideron is not to be given to non-Orthodox, to those who are not initiated, to those who uh, are catechumens or, 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 or inquirers. Strictly speaking, I know it happens in a lot of places and they don't have any problem with it. I'm telling you the akrivia here. I'm telling you what I understand to be the proper, uh, you know, most proper, most strict observance of these things. And it makes sense. Andi voro, instead of the gifts. So it's to those who could have communed but did not. That's why you don't take it if you commune. And obviously, if you cannot commune, if you're not initiated, you're not baptized, you're not chrismated, you can't commune. So therefore, and this one is not for you. You might say, well, Father, it's a very nice thing that we do. People feel good about it. Uh, maybe some people say this is a konomia. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Every priest, is, of course, and bishop can decide for themselves if they think that's a good idea. I personally think that the, we should be strict on these things and it helps people and it keeps the boundaries and it's good for those who are not communing and not initiated to understand the boundaries. We don't need to blur the boundaries to help them come to orthodoxy, rather the opposite. The fact that they understand the boundaries will, if they're sincere and seeking Christ, will only in, encourage and inflame the desire to be a part of the synaxi of the faithful. And that's another thing that we could talk about, but this is a little bit off topic. And that is that the it would be very good if parishes and priests and bishops went back to the ancient church's practice of having the catechumens and all the non-initiated depart from the temple, the main nave at least, and go to the narthex or the exonarthex after the catechumen prayers. And when at this point, we're in the liturgy of the faithful, after the gospel, after the catechumen, depart prayers, and we begin the cherubim. At this point, we're in the liturgy of the faithful. And that is for those who are preparing to commune. That's what this is all about. That's why we do everything we do after, after that point. It's all about communion. That's what's happening. So if you are not going to participate in the communion, your presence in the temple is not the same as the other person or the other people's presence in the temple. We have we have something that's now becoming a little bit, how can we say that? I mean, we do it all the time. People all over the world do it. I understand that, but I'm not sure if we're thinking about the implications always. Uh, but is it become semi, almost pietistic? I don't know. I don't know. But it could be that for some people where they're not going to commune, they're not communing on a regular basis, but they're there to pray. Now, that, that might have got a lot of spiritual benefit, but the meaning of what's going on after the catechumenate is to commune. So at least those who are catechumens or, or, or visitors who are not initiated, that's what happened in the ancient church. They departed from the nave of the church, at least. And this is an opportunity for catechumens, for inquirers, for non-Orthodox, to be approached by the church to be talked about and taught the faith during this time period, 30, 40, 50 minutes, whatever it is, and to actually go deeper because what they can't do in the divine liturgy to commune is not going to be that beneficial for them. In other words, if they're exposed to that and they can't commune, there's not a lot of benefit. Where there could be more benefit if they're catechized, they're taught by a, cate a catechist or by a deacon or whatever it might be, if possible, them to be in the hall or wherever it might be, and then to be at their level, at their place on the path to initiation to be approached and taught and benefited. But if you, just like anything, if you are exposed to something before it's time, when the time comes to be initiated, the, the value of it is much less. Imagine, obviously, the church teaches and condemns premarital sexual relations. There's a reason, because that's not the context. That isn't a blessing. That's not time and place. Those things matter. There's, there's a place and a time that's blessed for those relations. It's after the marriage, the blessing of the Lord, and the time now has come for this, this the relations and the union to take place. The order of things have been followed. Now it's time to be open to preparation. In that best context, the church says sexual relations are a blessing. Outside of that, they're not. They're not a blessing. They're not given by God for uh, 
The purpose is not met out of that context. It's something similar with the, with the communion, which is the most intimate thing that happens in the church. It has a context. It has preparation. There's a place and a time for that. If you're not initiated into the faith of the church, the life of the church, you've not been baptized, chrismated, you can't commune. And if you do commune, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual error of the first order. It's not going to be beneficial. So if we can get back to some of the basics of our church order, you're going to see these things are going to be, they're going to help tremendously spiritually, all of us. The antidoron, the, the, the whole meaning, if we can get back to the meaning of these things and practice them and go back to the akrivia of the church, we're going to be benefited spiritually. I'm convinced of that. Now, whether that happens or can happen or will happen in each parish, that's, of course, totally out of my hands and out of your hands. But I think that's the goal. Now, let's go on to another matter that is sometimes a controversy, especially in non-Orthodox countries, but not much of one if you're in um, many traditional Orthodox lands. And that is the head covering of women in the temple, uh, at least in the temple, although if you look at the patristic witness, it's not really talking about in the temple. That's what it's come to be, but it would be in the society generally. We go back all the way to the beginning of the church uh, the, in the New Testament with Paul, who clearly says in Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, that women should cover their heads when at prayer. There's no dispute that that is what Paul is teaching. Some people want to say, well, that was then, this is now. But that's not what the saints said even uh, the saints this day and our day, they teach this, they encourage it, they bless it. But in Tertullian's time in the third century, 300, 250 years after Paul, or 150, 200 years after Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul said this, he says the same thing. Uh, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he says, now the only question that was somewhat debated throughout church history is, is there an exception because of the age of, of the woman? In other words, non-married children, uh, you know, in their t 5, 10, 15-year-olds, should they be wearing a head covering? Uh, it's pretty much been in practice come down to us that all women are wearing head coverings, and there's a very good practical reason why that's the case. If you do not, in this day and age, from a young child, exercise this virtuous act and this 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 fulfillment of the symbols and the icons right this has a lot to do with uh honoring god and reflecting god's uh, authority and all the rest which i'm not going to get into tonight i'm not going to get into the why so much but just the what we do in church um uh it's very well explained online you can find a number of things that are explaining why this is a blessed and traditional practice that's come down to us from the apostles and the teachers of the faith but we have it going back from the very beginning. The only question is, is there an exception in terms of age? Now, what's come down to us is there are no exceptions. That women of all ages wear the head covering. And again, it's very good if a young girl begins at a young age to wear a head covering, then she'll probably do it all her life. In this day and age, with the, the intense secularization that we are facing, it's less and less likely if someone is only starting to wear a head covering at 15 or 20, that she's going to do it with all the pressure against it. So it's just a wise uh, uh, pastoral practice for this to be uh, done across uh, across the board with all the agents. Uh, but it's 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 witnessed to in an ancient in the ancient church as well, as you see here the apostolic tradition by Saint Hippolytus. Uh, even for the catechumens, of course, he's catechizing and he tells them that let all the women have their heads covered with an opaque cloth, etc. So there are many witnesses. I'm not including them. You can find the online articles that I've listed. You can find more quotes from patristic authors. But this is a practice that is given, is really not challenged at all in places like in, in Russia or Romania or in uh, traditional lands, uh, traditional monastic uh, monasteries in, uh, in Greece. Uh, that's the tradition. If you would have gone to my village when I was in Greece, uh, the village, uh, I talked to the old timers about this, and they said pretty much through the Second World War into the early 50s, uh, women across the board wore head coverings. What happened was a secularization, a Europeanization. Uh, the younger generation basically just following after the secular 
examples and the European examples that they were they were inundated with American and European prototypes. And so they essentially bought into the propaganda that that's for my grandmother and mother, that's not for me. And so they just, without any kind of uh, change in teaching or any kind of change pastorally, they just started to abandon it and become more secularized. So there really is no basis for the Orthodox Church today, anybody in the Orthodox Church to say, this is not a traditional practice, it's not blessed. So women wear the head coverings when they enter all the holy places today. They they pray with it, and this is a, uh, a practice that is ancient, and it's beneficial spiritually. I think if you talk to people who understand it and practice it, women, uh, you'll see that they come to and to live it and to and to appreciate it and actually be spiritual benefited. But there's a whole apologetic, which I'm not going to get into tonight, for why we do this. I mean, if you just look around any icon in any Orthodox church of a, of women, it, you're very rarely, maybe one in a thousand, one in 500, you're going to find a woman who's not he, doesn't have her head covered. Saints, I mean. Uh, there might be a few exceptions, but th that proves the rule. So that's that is a practice that goes back to the ancient church and is done in Orthodox churches. And unfortunately, as I said, the only reason it's not is because of a secularization of the church and a secular spirit that's crept in. Let's talk about the prayer rope. The prayer rope, which is and should be in everybody's hand in every Orthodox church and should be a part of their daily prayer life and prayer rule. What is the prayer rope? Well, basic definition here, the prayer rope uh, is what you see on the screen here, obviously. It's a loop of knots made of black dyed wool, which symbolizes our repentance, the blackness and the wool. They are used to keep track of the number of prayers said by moving along each knot. So here are my little prayer rope here, 33, 33 prayer rope. So Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Most holy Theotokos save us. Most holy Theotokos save us. See, this is very, very basic. It's only, the only reason why you would have this is for prayer. If you have it, is it looks nice and it's so, so you know, I just love to have it there. And, and people think I'm pious if I have that there. Then you are unfortunately in delusion. It's not for anything else, but to use to concentrate in keeping the name of Jesus Christ on your lips and in your heart continually in response, of course, to the admonition of the Apostle Paul to pray unceasingly in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, to pray unceasingly. Now, there are different ways to pray unceasingly, but this is the one that has by far been adopted from the earliest days and been embraced by the saints throughout the ages because it's the most effectual, shortest, and most uh, scriptural i mean the there are many examples of those calling out jesus son of david jesus son of god have mercy on me the basic petition of every believer so lord jesus christ have mercy on me there's a longer version lord jesus christ son of god have mercy on me a sinner in my experience in my understanding at least on athos the shorter version is much preferred because at this point you want to focus and you can you can focus better with less words essentially the same prayer the other two portions, a sinner and son of God, are not, uh, if you if you remove those, they're not removing the essence of the prayer. Whereas if you removed, obviously, Jesus Christ or mercy, there that would be a different prayer. Uh, but this is one that is preferred uh, to be able to be said more and uh, more attentively and, and, and quickly. So uh, in my experience, that's the uh, most common ver uh, version. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. The prayer robes vary in length. It's not just one. You see here in the corner, uh, the 33. To the right, the 100. To the left, up in the corner, is the 300. And then the, the other one, again, is a, a 100. Uh, the most common, of course, is the 100. But you'll see in the monastic uh, communities and others who are saying the prayer much more, they'll have the 300 prayer robe. Uh, so... There is obviously symbolism to all of the numbers. Uh, 50 represents Pentecost. There is also a 50, by the way, but not very often. You don't see that as much. Uh, the third represents the age of Christ. Uh, and then the numbers really serve 
to their, their, you'll see that a lot of prayer rules, you'll see them have a three to one ratio in terms of prayer. So we'll say 300 Jesus, Jesus prayers, 300 of them, and then 100 to the mother of God, most holy Theotoko, save us. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But so that's the most, uh, that ratio is three to one is usually what you'll see in terms of prayer rules, how many uh, each each should be said. Uh, there's also a 500 prayer rule, uh, a, prayer, a prayer rule, but that's very rare. And I, I actually rarely see that at all in even monastic communities. So let's talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the, how and what it's all about. Now I'm taking from a uh, uh, introduction to a little booklet. You see the uh, in orthodoxyfield.com praxis compischini up here on the right hand corner. That's where you can go to read the entire booklet. It's produced by the Holy Monastery of Xerapotamo on Mount Athos. It's been translated in English. It's on this website. And um, it's a basic introduction to the prayer rope. So if you want to learn more, and you should, and you want to start to, if you never don't know anything about it, you never used it, this is a good beginning. Go to orthodoxinfo.com, praxis called Baschini, as you see in the right hand corner. And, and this text that I'm going to read you here is the basic is excerpts from the introduction by the abbot of the monastery of Sirobotamu, uh, Elder uh, Archimandrite Joseph, who I have a picture of here on the left. Uh, and he writes the following, the prayer rope is not intended to be used only by monks. You hear that occasionally. Oh, that's for monks. We don't use the prayer rope. Or even the prayer rope is dangerous. Uh, I don't know how people get this idea the prayer rope is dangerous. Of course, it can be if you're if you're proud and arrogant, you don't have a spiritual father. I mean, there are things you need to do to do it right. But, but in and of itself, it's not dangerous to pray. Uh, but it can also be used by laymen, he says, and generally by anyone who wants to pray to God. The prayer rope is not some kind of amulet with magic or exercising powers like those given to simple-minded people by magicians, uh, to simple-minded people by magicians or mediums worn on the wrist or around the neck. On the contrary, it is a purely orthodox, holy object used only for praying and nothing else. We use the prayer rope in order to pray secretly. In other words, he wants to say, you know, in our closet, in our room. We don't go around flaunting it and say, oh, I pray that I hear my prayer rope and I pray the Jesus prayer. You know, we don't, it's not something you want to do. It's going to nullify your prayers because it's filled with pride. Right? We don't make a big deal about it. We don't wear it so everybody can see it. It's not a good idea because you're going to have secret pride and uh, it'll nullify the spiritual benefit of the prayers that you're, that you're offering. If you're sitting in pride and arrogance about you being a special uh, prayer warrior or something, right? So not a good idea. You want to avoid that. All right. So at this point, we have to note, the elder says, something very important. There are many books that refer to the prayer. However, before we start following any rule of prayer, we must necessarily ask for the advice, the blessing, and the spiritual guidance of a spiritual father, the priest to whom we confess our sins. Now, that, of course, is a, pretty much a given, and it should be expected. Unfortunately, as my experience has taught me over the last three years, with many of you and others writing me, many of you don't have spiritual fathers. You, you don't have somebody you go to regularly. Unfortunately, you're in a remote area, you're in a place that you, for whatever reason, can't get to, or it's just not uh, uh, really in your best interest because of a variety of delusions that exist today. And so you don't have the spiritual guidance that you need. Should you not say the Jesus prayer? Ideally, no. You shouldn't begin any kind of you know serious rule of the Jesus prayer. In reality, however, to wait for that may be a long, long time. So the royal path in this case, because the elder is talking about Greece, where nearly everyone can get to a spiritual father. They have many monasteries. In these exceptional times and exceptional places out in the middle of Canada or America or Australia or South Africa or wherever you are, and you don't have ready access to a confessor, uh, my suggestion would be, and you can take it to leave it, is to begin very slowly and and not do a great uh, uh, rule of prayer, but simply uh, and with your voice in the most humble and simple way, 
at the lower stages, let's say, of the prayer rule to begin to pray the Jesus prayer and then to pray it as much as possible throughout the day. Do not do anything much more than that without more spiritual guidance. Don't try to get into massive rule of prayer where you're going on for a long time or whatever it might be. You need spiritual guidance to make any real quantitative leaps, right? That's not a good idea. But if, uh, if you stay humble and simple and you use for a more limited way, we'll talk about numbers in a minute, but, if, but it, it is going to be, for some of you, very problematic and hard to get to that spiritual father who will guide you in the spiritual life and give you a rule of prayer for the, for the Jesus prayer. Fortunately, there are priests and others who don't want you to do the Jesus prayer for whatever reason. They're afraid of what might, might come of it. They're not, they don't feel themselves in a position to guide others in the Jesus prayer. And so therefore, they're not blessed. And that, and so you have the situation which is really hard and unique. As a rule, it's what the elder says, of course, there are exceptions, and I think the exceptions we have to really, you know, try to find the royal path and go step by step. And that's what I would counsel you, because I get a lot of you who write me and say what I just told you, and I know you're going to ask that question at the end of the night, well, what about me? I don't have a spiritual father. What should I do? That's how I would approach it. Do not make any serious, you know, jump into the Jesus prayer and do all kinds of long, you know, long, hour-long prayer rules, that would be a uh, problem. But to start little by little, humbly, I think, is not out of the question. Now, going on, he says, that is what the Holy Fathers have taught us for centuries in order to avoid delusion and thus not to lose the right Orthodox path. Absolutely. And you have to be very careful uh, before we make any, you know, major uh, uh, leap into the Jesus prayer. There are two ways we can pray using the prayer rope. Number one, at any time of the day, when we have free time without being seen by anyone, secretly we hold the prayer rope with our left or right hand and move from knot to knot with our thumb whispering simultaneously or meditating upon the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, or most holy Theotokos save us. Um, so just so people don't misunderstand the elder, he's not talking about Eastern meditation, he's not talking about Western meditation. This is not some technical term. He's just talking about focusing on the, the words of the prayer. At the time of our regular prayer, this is the most important. At the time of our regular prayer, when we pray following a rule of prayer that our spiritual father has told us to follow, we hold the prayer rope with our left hand between the thumb and the index finger and move from knot to knot. At each knot, we simultaneously do two things. With our right hand, we make the sign of the cross over ourselves. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And we say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. When we finish with all the knots of the prayer rope, we continue following the same procedure for as many times as our spiritual father has told us to do. So he's saying that, especially for beginners, but even many monks, to begin their prayer rule every night, they'll do this. They'll be, they'll They'll say it with their mouth, and they'll make the sign of the cross simultaneously as they say the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. All right? That's uh, to focus as much as possible. Use everything at your disposal to focus on the prayer and to pray with a contrite heart, a broken heart, a sincere heart. Ask God for that brokenness. Ask God to see your sins. Ask God to enlighten you and to see yourself, because that's key if you're going to make any progress. The humble meek, obedient soul who's struggling to keep the commandments is the one who's going to make progress in the prayer. Somebody who just looks at it as some kind of method in which they can make themselves holy is deluded. They're not going to make progress. You've got to have a life according to the gospel and prayer to God. Those two things are inseparable. They're assumed. When you turn to Christ, you're going to try to keep his commandments and everything. And that's when the prayers start to ascend we have humility, obedience, and we're struggling to be faithful to his commandments. All right, so that is a few words, but you can read much more. OrthodoxInfo.com, practice Cobertini. I suggest you all go there, download it, read it, and get the basics of the prayer uh, rope and the prayer rule, um, uh, you know, how to go about uh, praying the Jesus prayer. Now, what is a prayer rule? Let's just talk about that for a minute. Even though, again, you need a spiritual father. I'm not your spiritual father. You need a spiritual father, a guide, someone to say, here's what you need to do. You know, you could go to a monastery and an elder. You can go to a, a spiritual father who you might not see very often. 
You might see him once or twice a year. That's fine. That's not a problem. You can write him and communicate with him uh, through through email or whatever it might be. But you need someone who's going to say to you, okay, here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to pray. Here's how much you need to pray. That's very important. That shows obedience and that humility will protect you from delusion. Now, a prayer is a set of prayers that is said every single day without fail. Let me repeat that. A prayer rule that you should receive from your spiritual father, your spiritual guide, your confessor, your priest, is said every single day without fail. As a rule, it is said in the morning. That's the vast majority of people say their prayer rule when they get up in the morning and ideally before the sun comes out, ideally before there's any commotion, ideally before there's ruckus and there's people asking you for this. So before all that would be the ideal. Now, if you don't get there and you wake up late and you want to do your prayer rule and there's some people mulling around, go for it. Do it. Don't leave it. But it's better if you can get started earlier. So in the morning, first or nearly the first thing we do in the day, when you wake up, immediately turn to Christ, turn the icon cord and say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. First things out of your mouth. It should, the prayer rule should also include evening prayers as a rule, right? You're going to get a rule. How do, what do I do on a daily basis? It'll include the evening prayers as well. And usually in the Greek context anyway, you have the compline. You're saying the service of compline with or without the akathist hymn, the heredismi, they say in Greek, to the mother of God. Uh, it depends on your time, your family, how many kids you have, what kind of things you can do. But uh, in the monasteries, they, they included every compline, a canon or a uh, akathist hymn to the mother of God. Uh, but if that's not possible, do the compline at least. Now, other tradition, you know, Russian Orthodox tradition, they don't do the compline service as much, as, but they have a long, a, a, a fairly large group of prayers and other, you know, I think Psalm 50, et cetera, said psalms and prayers that are said every night as well. So that also could be the case with you if you're in uh, following the Jordanville prayer book, whatever, that's usually what people are going to do in the evening. But you're going to have a morning prayer rule, you know, in the morning you're going to get up and you're going to do the prayer rule. We'll talk about what might go into it. And in the evening as well before you go to bed. Now, in my experience, and I think this should, this was ideal, the Jesus prayer should be at the heart of the prayer rule. Again, with the analogous spiritual direction from the priest or or, or a spiritual father in your community, and the Jesus prayer should be cultivated intensely throughout the day, so that you are constantly in the presence and the and you're mindful of God. Uh, it is usually preceded by, of course, the Trisagium prayers, the 50th Psalm, the symbol of faith. Right? These are basic things that are said before you begin the prayer rule in the morning. Uh, you might also add prayers to the Holy Fathers. You might also commemorate some people who you want to pray for. Uh, there's other things that people add in. Many people begin their day by reading the epistle and the gospel. Very good. Or they read the lives of the saints. Very good. Or they read from some very good, important spiritual texts like the Ever to Get the Nos, uh, or the Saints of the Fathers, or you know, the Icon, we call it in Greek, or John of the Mask, John of the Ladder, or any number of other books that are going to be very profitable uh, to read throughout the year. There's also books like The Way of the Pilgrim, which is a tremendous book. I've read it multiple times, keep coming back to it. Very inspiring for the Jesus Prayer. So one could go on and talk about a whole no, whole whole library of books that could be read on a daily basis as a part of your morning rule. Now, the number of times that the prayer is recited will depend on a variety of factors. It'll depend, obviously, on your spiritual father's guidance and his blessing, but it'll, it'll depend on some practical matters, right? If you're a beginner, you're going to have far, far less number-wise than others who are more advanced. Uh, if you have a lot of things that are duties and you don't have the ability to say as much to spend enough time in the morning. That's also something that might affect how many times you say the prayer. Uh, whatever the case is, you receive that number and you try to keep that. Even if it's a small amount, it's really important. Or if it's a large amount, whatever it is, you have to struggle to keep that rule every day. It's very important. If you keep the rule, you will have 
great spiritual benefit and your day will be blessed. Your day will be filled with grace. If you are faithful in those things, God will make you uh, uh, put over other things and you'll have more responsibility and you'll have more grace to fulfill those duties. So it all is important. Doesn't matter how big it is. It's that what matters most of all is that you do it every day and you're faithful. And then, of course, you're going to take that throughout the day. You're going to start your day that way, and then you're going to keep that throughout the day. When you're in your car and you're to work, Lord Jesus Christ have mercy. When you're walking the street, when you're doing some kind of work that doesn't require a lot of concentration, uh, if you're uh, more, uh, your work is more manual, you can pray the prayer continually throughout the day. Of course, we're going to be praying before the meals. That's a part of our prayer rule. Before the meals, after the meals. Do you pray after the meals? There's a prayer after the meals as well. Do you pray different prayers in the morning or the noonday prayer meal and the evening meal? There's different prayers for that in the prayer book. And we should learn that by heart. So in everything, of course, the aim is to be always in the presence of God, to be united to God, right? That's the goal. That's what it means to be in Christ, to live for Christ, to already have one foot, as it were, in the kingdom of God, is that we're always in the presence of God. We're mindful of his will, and we're mindful, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, we're, our gaze is in heaven. It's to the right hand of the Father, to Jesus Christ. The prayer rule, as such, is to be kept in yourself, so to speak, right? Your, your prayer closet is not to be done in front of other people, maybe Maybe if you're married with your wife, you might be in the same room. It's fine. But generally, it's not the case. You try to avoid that. You're, you're going to be alone with God. Um, and as Archimandrite Sergius of St. Tikhon says, it's important to remember that we never have time for God, but rather we must make time for God. If you think that you're going to have time, it's just going to happen without an effort, without violence. Like he says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. You have to force yourself. Many times, you'll have to force yourself to pray. You won't want to pray. You'll be tired. You'll, be, you'll have an inclination to go to sleep, whatever it is. And you need to force yourself. But guess what? The good news is that's when prayer really has a lot of value. Even if you don't feel it, God sees the struggle. And the demons see the struggle. And they fear that philotimo struggle, right? They fear that love that says, even though I'm tired, I'm distracted, I'm, I'm, I'm worried, I'm anxious, I don't care. I'm going to pray. I'm going to turn it to pray to God. Too many people think they're going to have to have a great desire already before they turn to God, turn to pray. That's not the case. The saint struggled. The great elder struggled. No one has not struggled against the old man and forced themselves to pray. No one. There's not one person. In the face of the earth that didn't have to force themselves at some point and in, in perhaps many, many times. So let me give you as a example, it's not for you to do, obviously, it's an example just to get a sense of numbers and what people might do in different places. And I'm going to give you an example of a beginner monk, a novice monk, somebody who's just starting out on Mount Athos and they want and they're doing a prayer rule. Uh, and, uh, you know, number wise. Now, again, numbers are not that important. And th there might be somebody at the same numbers for 10, 20 years. It doesn't matter. That's not the most important thing. If you if you can and you increase the numbers and you have a blessing, fine. That's a blessing. It's wonderful. If you can pray more and more throughout the night, as some of our great saints did, of course, that's a blessing. But if you do it, if you increase the numbers and you have no concentration, you're not well trained, you're not, then you're going to end up burning out. You're going to end up offering a lot of vain repetition because your heart is not there. You're not progressed. You're not able to concentrate. So step by step. But to give you a sense here on the page, you see some numbers you might see for a novice beginning monk on Mount Athos. He might do 900 to 1,200 prayers to Jesus Christ. That means, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. With the sign of the cross, vocalized. That's how he'll begin his prayer rule. Uh, most likely. I mean, again, it could be less, it could be more. I'm just giving you a ballpark figure of what, in my experience, what what might be the case for a novice monk among others. There might be other monasteries that have less. There might be other monasteries that have more. So don't take this as some kind of standard. It doesn't exist. Standards don't exist. Spiritual fathers and the particular person exists. 
but I'm giving you a sense of things, right? So you can understand. Now people say, well, how can they do a thousand times? It seems like it's crazy, it's insane. How can they do it? Actually, the prayer could be said in a second or two, right? Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy me, can be said within one, two seconds. And the more you pray, the quicker it gets, the more you're focused, the, the quicker you're done with 300, 300 uh, knot prayer rope. So it seems like a lot for those who have been, don't have experience of it, but actually you, if you pray and you spend time praying over time, you realize that it's not actually that much. I mean, that could be done within a half an hour, certainly, uh, by most people who are praying and struggling uh, on um, methods. 600 to 900 prayers to Jesus Christ without the sign of the cross said within, without being vocalized, would be a, a part of the prayer rule. And then 300, because we're always keeping a three to one ratio usually with the prayer, 300 to the Theotokos with the sign of the cross, and then 100 prayers to the Theotokos without the sign of the cross. We're talking about the most holy Theotokos, save us. And then maybe 100, maybe 150 prostrations, maybe 200 prostrations. It really depends on the physical condition of the monk or the novice and the person who's doing it. It might be uh, more, it might be less. Uh, but I would think that most novices are going to be doing a, a hundred or even 150 or 200 prostrations each evening. Uh, and they're in good shape and they're struggling there on that athlete. So that gives you a sense a little bit about the numbers. But most of us, especially beginners, are going to be doing 300 to Jesus Christ, 100 to the Mother of God, and that's it. And then they're doing 10, 20, 30, 50 prostrations. It really depends on the person. But that would be a beginner Somebody want, just want to get started. I want to get started right now. I've never done this before. I would say the max they would do in the first, you know, a long period of time, first months or something, depends on the person again in their life, would be 300 to Jesus Christ. And it, concentrating, right? So you're going to be concentrating on those words, Lord Jesus Christ and mercy, trying to have a prayer that comes from your heart and with compunction. Uh, and then 100 to the mother of God, something like that might be for a brand new, never done before, you know, beginner. Now, there's some questions people ask me, and I thought I would throw this in here, but again, this is not a standard. I, I think there's their numbers here are just indicative. Probably there are more, more uh, in, in more monasteries. These numbers looked low to me in my remembrance of this question from years ago when, when I learned about this, but I think it, it definitely is, you know, changes depending on the monastic and the father. There is this ability, and this does happen in some uh, cells in Manathos, especially where you have one or two monks who don't have a spiritual, who don't have a, a priest monk with them, or even those that do, but they don't want to do the services. Uh, uh, they'd rather do it on the prayer rope, and they just come together for the hours in divine liturgy. So they'll do the services on the prayer rope. So instead of Vespers, they'll do, for instance, 600, which I think is probably not enough. In most monasteries, they'd be doing more. But maybe this is more uh, uh, ideal for laymen. Uh, so for canonical hours, for preparation for Holy Communion, and other services, in some monastic communities, in some monasteries, they replace these with the Jesus prayer. A specific number of times dependent on the service that's being replaced. So in this way, even without service books, uh, without the priest monk, obviously, uh, somebody who's not literate, uh, whatever it might be, there's a way to keep the prayer services of the church in this way. And some places do it, as I said, because they prefer it. They're hesychastic oriented, and they really want to say the Jesus prayer. And you will see that in the lives of some of our contemporary saints. So, for instance, St. Joseph has guest Kili. I don't remember them ever doing matins, except on big feast days. I think they did the Jesus prayer throughout the night, and they would come together with the uh, hours in divine liturgy. Now, I might be mistaken, but that was my recollection. But there are Kelia who do exactly that. In fact, some of the monasteries in Greece that we would go to frequently, they did not have matins at all mo most days. If it's a feast day, they do, but on a daily basis. And they would do the Jesus prayer. And they would come together if they didn't have a priest and do the paraclesis, the canons of the mother of God. So there are a variety of prayer rules, a variety of conditions, and you're not strapped in in the Orthodox Church. But you need blessings, you need guidance, but there are a variety of solutions for each person. But you can see on the screen here some of the numbers that might be 
said of the Jesus prayer instead of divine services. So instead of the entire Psalter, which is rarely, I've never heard this actually been done, 6,000 Jesus prayer, uh, one kathisma of the Psalter, 300 prayers, 100 for each stasis. The minute off is 600, matins 1,500. The hours without the inter hours, 1,000. The hours with the inter hours, 1,500. Seems a bit high. Vespers only 600, but the hours are 1,000. So these numbers, you know, they're, they, they're not written in stone by any stretch of the imagination. So grand comp line would be more than Vespers. That seems a little bit off. And then small, uh, small comp line, uh, 400. In any case, uh, that gives you a little sense. If you can't get to church uh, and you want to pray, just pick up the Jesus prayer and start praying a few 100, 300, uh, whatever it might be for your particular case, uh, and, and be in the presence and remembers of God. That's the aim. How about the Orthodox prayer corner? Everybody has an Orthodox prayer corner, right? Everybody knows about the prayer corner. In our house, as you can see here, in an old picture from the pre-revolutionary Russia, this was the corner of their living room. And they have there the analogion before the, the massive collection of icons. These would, these would have been icons made by hand in those days. I don't think they had any kind of mass production of icons. But that was a treasure in the house. I remember when, when, there, when I was reading about the... Uh, Population exchange when all the Greeks from Asia Minor and Pontos and all those places were forced out and forced to, to march across Asia Minor and to go to Greece. Of course, what they took with them was the holy icons. They were the treasure of the family. They were the things they wanted to pass on to their children. And the holy icons, the most important icons they took with them when they were thrown out and run out of their homelands. And the same with Russians who were fleeing the communists. So uh, it is ideal for all of us to have icons that are hand-painted. That's what we should be saving up for, putting money aside. Uh, have hand-painted uh, icons would be the ideal. Now, many of us can't do that. We don't have the money. So, of course, it's for, for, perfectly blessed to get icons that are made uh, in other ways, like paper or um, other. There's other ways that they make icons today that are more akin to um, painted icons, but it shouldn't. We shouldn't necessarily be um, satisfied if we fill our house with all kinds of paper icons, and then we say, "Well, that's it." It is blessed, and it is desirable for us to purchase from icon iconographers hand painted icons, which then become treasures to our family. We have them in a you know a special place. And it's, it's, um, it's really, I think, beneficial spiritually. So let's talk about the prayer corner. The prayer corner, obviously, most of you should know this, I hope, is a physical place reserved for personal and family prayer. In the Orthodox countries, the faithful call it the front corner, the beautiful corner, the holy icon corner, whatever. God's place, uh, whatever its name, this prayer corner is the spiritual heart of the home. This reminds me of a prophecy by one of the elders in the 1940s. I think it was, uh, I think it was uh, the Ukrainian saint. I want to say Lazarus, but I can't remember actually if that's his name. It just escaped me. He talked about the box that will come, and it will have horns on it, and it will replace the prayer corner. And this will be a way that the Antichrist will guide and, and, and trick the, the masses to follow after him. Of course, he's talking about the television. He's talking about the modern way of communicating, just like we're doing right now. That this box will become the center of the home, and the icon corner will be forgotten. And what a tragedy the 20th century saw with communism and secularism and capitalism and all these isms, which have refocused people. It's it's very different home, and I've said this many times. I'll say it again. It's a very different home to walk into when the icon corner is the center. There's no television in that place. And people sit down and look at each other face to face. And they don't look at a screen all day. So if you have a television and that's the center of your family and you want to be an Orthodox Christian, take that, throw it out into the garbage and replace it with your icon corner and begin to make that the center of your house. And 
it should serve as a constant reminder to pray. Instead of, I'm going to sit down and lose myself and have no benefit whatsoever. I'm going to watch some television show. No, no, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to find myself and find my God and be in communion with him. And that will be, the prayer corner will be the place that will draw you in to remind you, right? It should be a sanctuary for you and your loved ones, a place where you can rest and renew yourselves as you live in this world. That's the basics of the prayer corner. Now, here's some examples that I'm giving you, and we'll talk about some of the things we see here. So obviously you can have one central icon corner, but in every room, ideally, you could have an icon corner as well, something very simple like you see in the middle of the page on the bottom. We have just three icons on a shelf with a beautiful uh, cloth and, and flowers around it. That would be in the corner of the room, your bedroom or the, the bedrooms of the house. Uh, even in the kitchen, you could have an icon or two, um, like the one you see here on the left, which is just a small corner with a uh, shelf and an icon um, uh, oil lamp. I should say, before the icon. Uh, not just this massive icon corner you see on the top left, which would be in the center of the house, but all these, these smaller ones could also be in each room. And it is very common to have before the icons, like you see on the far right, this is from the Holy Cross Monastery in West Virginia, in the uh, visitor's house there, they have these icons, and then they have this analogion, and in front of that they have the prayer book, they have what looks like the priest book, the, the, the uh, blessing book, and then you have the uh, scriptures, and you have the cross, uh, and then it looks like you have some other service prayers there in the paperback or in uh, photocopy, and that is very common. So when you go to the prayer corner, of course, you're going to want to have a table or on the actual shelf, you're going to want to have a censer, your incense, you want to have the oil lamp, you're going to want to have the tool, tool, whatever you need there the oil down below. You want to have all the things there that you can maintain uh, the prayerful atmosphere. You're going to want to pray before the icons with the oil lamp, etc. Uh, all of this you can learn online. I don't need to go into a lot of details. There's plenty of articles on it. But I think you could you could uh, follow the link that I have underneath the title here, and you could just yourself and find out more about what goes into a prayer corner. But obviously you're going to have the icon of Christ, you know, the icon of the mother of God, like you see in the middle here, you have Christ on the right, right, and the mother of God on the left, and you have, looks like maybe the patron saint in the middle, uh, and you have the oil lamps before them, which is very good, very basic. So you're going to be, you're going to have to be buying, obviously, a lot of olive oil, because that's what we use in the, in the lamps. Now, there's other kinds of oils, but the tradition is olive oil, and that's, uh, as St. Paisio said, we give the best to the Lord, and we, we offer that up to him. So that should give you some basic sense of what an icon corner should be about. Now, what else can I say before we depart? Uh, whatever I'm not saying, you can ask me in the questions, uh, if you have some particular questions about this. But here's where you're going to say your prayers before communion. Here's where you're going to say uh, your, your comp line in the evening. Um, you're not going to necessarily say your prayer rule here unless you live alone, because that's what you want to do in your own bedroom or wherever you have that you can be alone with God. Um, and this is going to be more communal. All right, let's talk about how to prepare for confession. How to prepare for confession. So before we ever get to the confessor to say our sins, there's a few things we need to be doing on a daily basis. Whenever we fall into something, Uh, I just saw somebody ask, should it be going to the East? Yes, we always pray to the East. We always pray to the East in the Orthodox Church, whether it be in church, or whether it be in the prayer corner, or whether it be even our own little prayer room, you know, closet. We're going to try to face the East, ideally. Now, if it's just impossible for whatever reason, then so be it. But that's what we should struggle to do is to face the East. Because that, that goes back to the very, very beginning of the church. Uh, from the very beginning, we have witnessed in the early saints that we pray to the East always. And St. Basil talks about that, that this is not something that came down uh, in written form, but in oral holy tradition. And it is a rule that the church never doubted and never undermined. All right, so 
immediately, brothers and sisters, whatever happens, you fall into an evil thought. You fall into an evil practice. You do something that is not God's will. You immediately repent. You don't wait to go to confession. This mystery of holy confession is two-part. Repentance and confession. Before you go to confession, you should have already been on the path of repentance and 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 a reorientation back to Christ and a hatred of that which disoriented you, right? That sin. Hate the sin. We don't hate the person, but the sin, that which takes us away from Christ. So we repent immediately for whatever happens. And then we keep a little book, especially if you're beginning in the beginning of the spiritual life. You've only been Orthodox for a while. You're a catechumen. Uh, you haven't really worked on yourself spiritually. You've never been to really systematically to confession with the spiritual father. All of these categories means you need to have a little booklet. It goes in your purse or in your pocket. And in, in that little booklet, you're going to do a daily re recording of your falls, of your thoughts, your temptations, your struggles, your questions for the spiritual father. You might not do that for the rest of your life, but you should do that for a long time, a couple of years. So you get to the point where that becomes something now you've made much progress in, in self-knowledge, you've made progress in mindfulness, you've been, made progress in watchfulness, you understand the nature of the temptations, you've seen it, you go then to your spiritual father ready. You don't have to think about it. You don't, oh, I spent weeks and months since it's over my spiritual father. What, what am I going to tell him? Bad place to be. Not a good place to be. You're not going to have a lot of profit out of that spiritual counsel he's going to give you because you're not going to be able to give him a good picture. When you go to the doctor, he wants a full report. What did you do? What didn't you do? What are you suffering from, right? And then he can make a good judgment on what happened to you, what caused your sickness. I was just at the doctor yesterday for my son. He had fallen down. He asked all kinds of questions. And then he said, okay, here's what I think it is, right? So you're going to go to the spiritual father and you're going to say, uh, well, I did, I was really proud. Uh, I was, uh, I was lazy. That's not going to help much. Of course, you're going to confess all that if you know that, that. but he needs more hands-on details. What's going on? You're not going to go into details if they're fleshly sins. No, we don't do that. But everything else we can say, here's what happened, Yeroda. I was with this person. I said this to her. And then she said this to me, and then I got angry. And and then, and he's gonna. And then I see a pattern here. I did this again the next day, and then the third day. And look, I. And you go there with a full X-ray of your soul, and of your behavior, and what happens, and what you didn't do right, and what you did do right. You no know, sins are not just what you did wrong. It's what you didn't do right. right? What you neglected to do. You got to write that down. You got to go there. So if you want to make a good confession, the good confession begins the minute you end your previous confession. That's when the good confession begins. Weeks and months or whatever it is, until you go again to your spiritual father, you're recording, you're giving us a picture, a very detailed picture of your soul and your struggle. All right, very important. Again, because we need help to see ourselves, we use these guides to confession that exist online. There's actually a link right underneath the title here, orthodoxinfo.com, Praxis Guide to Confession, and go and check that out. There's also uh, a couple more aids on orthodoxinfo.com that I highly recommend. So check those out as well. Do a little search there on orthodoxinfo.com for help me with confession, right? How do I make a good confession? And you're going to want to use those guides because they're going to help you to see yourself. There's going to be things you don't really think about. There's sins that we commit. We don't realize they're sins or there's habits that set in or whatever, right? So those guides are going to help us a lot to, to come to a self-knowledge, which is essential. We prepare for holy confession by praying, by praying the Jesus prayer, by the Akathist hymn to the Lord Jesus Christ, or the canon of repentance. These are all beautiful ways to prepare for confession. As you grow more and more, you may not have such a great need to pray every time before confession. But certainly for a couple of years in the beginning, when you go to confession, it's really good if you can say the canon of repentance before you go to confession, 
say the Akathis to Lord Jesus Christ, say uh, more prayers to our Lord in different ways, and that'll help you to make a good confession with a broken heart. Now, prepare also for confession by collecting your questions. You don't just go to tell your sins and leave. You have questions. And if you don't have questions, there's something wrong. You're not working on yourself. You're not being mindful. You're not asking questions about the spiritual life. You're not trying to go deeper. So you should go with a list of questions for your spiritual father. Ideally, at least in the Greek tradition, the Mount Athos tradition, you would see your spiritual father and there would be a good chunk of time allotted to speak to him and talk to him about your spiritual life. If you're going every Friday or every uh, rather Saturday vigil and you only got five minutes, then I would ask the spiritual father or the priest for time outside of that to sit down and talk about your life and about what you're doing, mainly your spiritual life, but even other big decisions. We go to our spiritual father for big decisions because we need discernment about things. Many times we're doing things, we're making decisions, and they have spiritual implications. And they're unwise. They bring about bad consequences. If we had gone to our spiritual father with those questions, we may have gotten a much better result and maybe have avoided a lot of problems. So prepare your confession, not just by telling your sins, but by bringing your questions about the whole nature of the spiritual life and about whatever it might be that, that affects your life in Christ to your spiritual life. Uh, ideally, arrange to see your spiritual father when he has time to guide and counsel you, like what we just said. Plan for confession before major feasts and days when you will be preparing for Holy Communion. So, you know, there's a feast coming up. We got the Feast of Pentecost is coming up. Uh, if you haven't been to confession for a good amount of time, you should be calling your spiritual father and saying, can I come to confession next week? Don't go the last minute. Don't go on the eve of the feast. If possible, don't make it hard on the priest. Don't, don't come during divine liturgy. In some places they do this. I don't think it's a very good idea. But anyway, don't do that. Go early. Get in early and be prepared for Holy Communion. Let's talk about how to prepare now for Holy Communion. Uh, obviously, if you're going to be communion on a regular basis, you need to be fasting. The fasts of the church are not optional. We don't say, oh, I'll, I'll fast. Maybe I won't fast. Maybe I'll commune anyway. No, that's the part of our life in Christ. And uh, we need to um, fast if we're commune on any regular basis. If we don't fast on Wednesday and Friday, if we don't fast, uh, from all of which the church says we need to fast, then we need to go to our spiritual father and say, this is my life. This is how I live. And ideally, he's going to say, well, here's how often you can commune. And it won't be that often. It won't be as often as you may have been used to because that's not profitable for us. If we're, we're setting aside the basic struggle and the cross and the crucifixion that the Lord says we have to pick up but then we still want the spiritual benefit of communion. Well, that's not going to happen. We're not going to have a lot of uh, benefit if we're putting aside the basics and the commandments uh, that come down to us through the church. It's a pious practice arising from the monasteries to keep a fast, and the strictness varies from spiritual father to spiritual father, the day before we go to Holy Communion. Now, this is not a part of the canons of the church. It's not a part of any kind of requirement. There's nowhere in the canons that say we have to commune in order to, uh, I'm sorry, to fast in order to commune on Sunday. This is a pious and very broad, in my experience, at least in Greece, tradition and practice among many spiritual fathers because they saw the benefit of this. It doesn't have to be a canon. Not everything is in a canon in an ecumenical council. It's not necessary. When our spiritual fathers, our elders, the saints show us, here's what's profitable, we should wisely say, let it be blessed. And many spiritual fathers say, it's profitable, it's very good. If the night, at least the night before we commune, we should fast from you know, everything but oil. On Saturday, as you'll see when we get there in a bit, uh, we don't fast on Saturdays from oil. But we could fast from other things. That's certainly possible. It's not required, but it's possible. So many spiritual fathers have their spiritual children fast, either from the very beginning of the day or the midday meal or the evening meal. 
depending on the person, the spiritual father, and how they understand things, there's a variety of, of different ways to approach this. But there is usually something on the eve, before we go to communion, we're not going to eat meat. We're not going to eat dairy. We're going to fast from those things in order to prepare ourselves in a better way, be more mindful and, and lighter when we go to pray. And that's very, very much at the heart of uh, the ascetic struggle. If you eat a good sized meal and then go to pray, that's going to be much harder to concentrate. You're not, you're going to be distracted. Your, your stomach's going to be growling. You're going to be, uh, maybe you're going to, uh, you know, have stomach pains, whatever. It's not a good idea. So the same thing applies when we're going to communion. We want to pray. We want to go to the vigil. We want to go to the minute uh, in the morning. We want to be light. We don't want to be thinking of our stomach and we don't want to have uh, distractions like this. So that's one reason why spiritual fathers find it profitable to fast on the eaves before uh, communion. But you need to have a spiritual father and you need to consult him and ask his guidance on what kind of fast you should do. Number three, go regularly to confession and receive the blessing of your spiritual father as to how often you can commune. We don't go to communion anytime we want as, as we like, but we get a blessing from our spiritual father, our spiritual guide, and he tells us, here's how often you should commune given your lifestyle, given your prayer rule, given your ability to do fasting and all the rest right you're not if you're if you're going to be for whatever reason you're more lax you want to have uh you know eat whatever you want you want there's gonna you don't want any limit to if you're married relations or whatever it is that you don't want to struggle well and that you're going to commune analogously you're going to commune less you're not going to commune as often that that's generally the approach of most most spiritual fathers in my experience as i said you abstain from relations before you go to Holy Communion. That's very much common. Elder Cleop of Romania taught this. The saints and that I, the, the contemporary saints from Greece teach this, contemporary elders. It's very basic, at least in the old world. Relations in marriage are abstain, you're abstaining from relations two, three days, at least two nights, three nights usually. Most spiritual fathers would say three nights before Holy Communion, and the day of Holy Communion, for sure, you're, com you're abstaining from uh, relations uh, in marriage. And this is consistent with the, what the Apostle Paul says. He says, fast, abstain, come together, that you not be tempted, etc. It's a, it's a, there's a rhythm in the church that we follow, and everything fits in beautifully. And when we follow it humbly and obediently, we have great profit. I talked about this in uh, one of these shorts that we put up on uh, YouTube and uh, Instagram. We talked about this in an interview I did a couple months ago. We reposted it last week about the need for this rhythm and this spacing and this abstention. It's very good for the family, uh, the, uh, good for the marriage and the very good for the like, longevity of a healthy marriage. People who abuse that and, and they give no boundaries to any of the, uh, in terms of relations, they will grow apart quicker than those who do not. And you might think that's counterintuitive, but that's the experience of many spiritual fathers. When there's no limit on something, you get sick of it. When you eat whatever you want to eat, day in and day out, you don't respect the food, you don't like the food after a while, you become you know, indifferent, you become whatever. You don't actually have a greater respect and, 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 and you, don't, uh, you, 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 you grow sick of it, right? If you eat ice cream every day, you're going to get sick of it. And it's the same thing with relations and the same thing with generally with fasting. Uh, the more we have a rhythm and we, 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 we maintain that, the more we're going to in, not only be benefited spiritually, but the things themselves are going to be more enjoyable and profitable for us. Again, uh, number five now, pray the pre-communion prayers. The canon on the evening beforehand, usually a comp line, we say the canon, and the psalms and the prayers on the morning of before matins. Now, you could do the whole thing in the evening. That's possible. If you're getting up late, you're going in the middle of the service, you know, going late to the service, and you don't have time in the morning because you get up late, well, do the whole thing in the evening. In any case, we have the canon, psalms, and prayers. That's what we pray, prayers before Holy Communion, before we go to Holy Communion. Every time, unless 
for some reason, rarely were communing one day after the other, then there might be, uh, you might, the second day you might not do the entire rule, uh, maybe just the prayers, uh, for example. But that, that's going to be decided by your spiritual father. Number six, fast from everything from the time you wake up or at least six hours before Holy Communion. We don't eat anything in the morning before we go to church. Now, if somebody said, well, I take pills and I'm sick, and da-da-da, of course there are exceptions depending on your health. If you take pills and you need to drink water, that's not breaking the fast. That's taking care of the body. That's not an issue of, you know, not caring, not having obedience, not having fear of God. That's something that this has to be done. And it's not a disposition of, of not caring and not trying to keep the commandments. So that's an exception. If we're in good health and we have no need to eat anything uh, for some you know, health problem or no pills to take, obviously we should be fasting all morning. If divine liturgy for some reason is not in the morning, for instance, it's a vigil in the middle of the night or it's divine liturgy of pre-sanctified gifts, um, then at least six hours, more people should do eight hours. Pre-sanctified gifts, in my experience, and spiritual fathers that I know, they would say from the morning, if not even earlier. So it depends, of course, on your spiritual father and your ability to fast. But certainly six hours is the minimum, absolute minimum that you would you must not eat before you go to Holy Communion. That's the way it is. That's how we've always done it. That's the profitable spiritually for us. It's good for us not to eat before we go and pray, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So number seven, stay until the end of divine liturgy. Listen to the post-communion prayers if they're read in your parish. In many places, they do read them after the end of the service, but stay until the end of the service. Do not leave divine liturgy unless you are going to serve, for some reason, uh, uh, the community or wherever you might be. Let's talk about prostrations in our kili. We do prostrations in the Orthodox Church on a daily basis. It's a part of our prayer rule for the vast majority of people, unless there's some physical problem. Now, there's older men, for instance, who their knees are shot. Right, they got to get knee replacements or older women. Obviously, they're not going to do prostrations. In that case, you replace the prostrations you would normally do with the Jesus prayer. So, if you did 100 prostrations or 50 prostrations, you would do maybe another 100 or 300, depending on your spiritual uh, condition, whatever. You would add uh, instead of those prostrations, you would do the Jesus prayer. You wouldn't just say, "Oh, I'm old now," or "Oh, my knees are broken. I don't have to do anything." No, you continue the struggle in a different way. Uh, but let's just talk about the basic practice. It goes back to the ancient church, of course. St. Basil the Great says, each day by practicing prostrations to the ground and by standing up again, we show that through sin we fell to the earth and through love of mankind, of our, our, of our creator, we were recalled to heaven. So the prostrations are not some simple physical exercise. There's a spiritual phenomenon here. There's a spiritual aspect of this, which is very beneficial. It shows forth our salvation, and it creates in us compunction and contrition, but we have to do it prayerfully. So how many we're going to do? That depends on your spiritual father and his guidance. How we do it, though, we pray doing it. We don't do it physically. It's not just a physical exercise. We say the Jesus prayer when we do it. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, right? Uh, and we pray doing the prostrations. And then, obviously, we're going to be doing the prostrations toward the east and toward the icon of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a part and parcel of our prayer rule. Now, what about just physically? How do we do prostrations? People oftentimes ask that, and it's fairly straightforward. We're going to lean forward, slightly bend our knees, extend our hands to the ground, either with our hands like this, and we put our this part of our, our hand we put on the ground. I know it sounds like it might hurt, but after a while, it doesn't hurt at all. It actually helps you to do it more quickly. Or we can have our hands open like this and do it that way. That's fine, too. I find that that is harder and takes longer, but it's up to each person. Put the hands out, and then essentially they bow down, and they put their hands on the ground, and then their knees hit the ground, and then their forehead touches the ground, and then they repeat that. All right? So that's how we do the prostrations. We do it, and eventually you'll get to the point where it becomes a, a rhythm, very simple and easy, and you can do those prostrations. Um, you know, there are ascetics on Athos back in the day. I don't know if this is still happening, but in the day of St. Joseph the Hesychus, they were doing 
not hundreds, but thousands of frustrations a night. It seemed impossible to us, but they were, there were times when they would do that. I would say that hundreds is far, far more common, if not um, really all that happens today, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. There might be some real super ascetics somewhere who are praying throughout the night and doing frustrations all throughout the night. All right, let's talk about the day of the Lord and how we live it. The day of the Lord being Sunday. Many people, unfortunately, are under the mistaken impression that we kneel down and do prostrations on Sunday. We do not. There are several canons of the church that forbid this, and there are church fathers from the earliest days that witness to the reality that we do not bend our knee on Sunday. We do not. And let's hear from them and the canons as to why that is. But first, before we get to that, let's just talk about the fact that we don't fast on Sundays, ever. And if it's a fasting period, we'll always have a relaxation of the fast and eat oil. That's true on Saturday and Sunday, right? So Saturday and Sunday are always going to be days where we eat oil. The only exception is Great and Holy Saturday, when the Lord was crucified and in, put in the tomb and in Hades. On that day, we fast even for oil. All other Saturdays and Sundays will have at least a little oil on our table, even if we're fasting strictly from meat and dairy, if that's our, if that's our rule or choice. Uh, but we will eat a little bit of oil at some point during the day. That's just the rule from the ancient times. And it's the wisdom of the Holy Fathers. So if we do it, we'll understand why, I think, if we do it. If we stand in contempt and say, well, that sounds dumb to me, well, okay, then you stay with your your bright-eyed and uh, you know smart uh, thoughts, but you'll miss the prophet uh, that the Holy Fathers have taught and experienced for 2,000 years. Um, so the 66th canon of the Holy Apostles, this is in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, if any clergyman is found to be fasting on a Sunday or on a Saturday, except on Great Saturday, he should be defrocked. So no more priesthood on that basis alone. If anybody fasts completely from oil included on a Saturday or Sunday. Now, maybe there's some special cases and very rare, some great ascetics that have done this. I don't know. I, I've heard such things, but I think that for the vast, vast majority of us, 99.9% .9 of us, let's keep that rule of the Holy Apostles. St. Peter of Alexandria says this in his Canon 15. As for Sunday, on the other hand, we celebrate it as a joyous holiday because of him who was resurrected on it, on which day we have not even received instruction to bend the knee. So we do not bend our knee. This is from the early 4th century Peter of Alexandria, or late 4th uh, uh, century, let's see, early, late 3rd century, rather. St. Basil the Great says in his Canon 91, we offer prayers on the first of the Sabbaths, he means Sunday, that's what that term is, in a standing position. We do not bow uh, or, or kneel down at all on Sunday. That's another church father from the ancient church. Now, again, another, more, more witnesses to the fact that we do not bend our knee on Sunday. The practice of not bending the knee on a Sunday is a symbol of the resurrection through which we were delivered by the grace of Christ, both from our sins and from the death, which was put to death by Christ himself. That's St. Irenaeus of Lyon, 4th century. Canon 20 of the First Ecumenical Council, this is the 320s, right? Stipulates, because there are some persons who kneel in church on a Sunday and during the days of Pentecost in church, we're talking about in church, not in our, not in our cell, not in our kili, not alone with God, but in church, because some people are doing that in church, we do it best in this holy council because we want uniformity in the parishes, not everybody doing whatever they want, but there will be uniformity in terms of the divine worship of the church. Prayers should be offered to God while standing. All right, So we do not bow. Now, we have another witness. Canon 90, the Sixth Ecumenical Council, says specifically, we have received it canonically from our God-bearing fathers not to bend the knee on Sundays when we honor the resurrection of Christ. 
Since this observation may not be so clear to some of us, we are making it plain to the faithful that after the entrance of those in holy orders into the sacrificial altar on the evening of Saturday, he means that the great entrance at Vesper on Saturday, let none of them bend the knee until the evening of the following Sunday. In other words, great entrance of Sunday evening. So from Vespers to Vespers, no bending of the knee. When after the entrance in Vespers, we bend the knees again and begin to offer prayers to the Lord. Now, the Feast of Pentecost is coming up, and you'll find in many parishes, which I find not the best practice, personally, they don't, and it's, I understand it's, it's helpful practically, but it's, it's, it's somewhat problematic. Many parishes will have the Vespers of the next day, in other words, Sunday night for the day of the Holy Spirit, which is Monday. They'll have it immediately after Divine Liturgy on Sunday morning. So it's Vespers. So I suppose, I suppose technically we're not violating this canon, but it is Sunday. And we've moved up Vespers to a time when we never have for practical reasons for people who can't come back to church, et cetera, et cetera. But you see that it's at Vespers and not in the divine liturgy of the morning of Pentecost that we have the kneeling prayers uh, for uh, calling down the Holy Spirit on the day. So great day of Pentecost. Uh, well, actually, the day of the Holy Spirit, which is the next day. So, for inasmuch as we have received it, that in the night succeeding Saturday was the precursor of our Savior's rising, we commence our hymns at this point spiritually, ending the festival by passing out of darkness into light, in order that we may hence celebrate in Mass the resurrection for a whole day and a whole night. All right, so I think you've got the point. And now, from going forward, no matter what happens in your parish, you don't kneel on Sunday. And now, there are going to be people who are going to say, well, my parish does that. Everybody kneels. It's okay. Go stand in the corner. Keep keep the canons. This is I give, we've given you three different patristic witnesses, two can two ecumenical councils. Fortunately, a lot of ignorance. People don't understand, and they don't live the day of the resurrection in that way. It's un, it's unfortunate. Uh, I know people are going to say, well, they're piously kneeling. Yes, I understand that, but the things are done properly and in an order according to the Holy Fathers, not according to my personal piety. It's not a question of what I want to do and how I want to express myself. In the church, we don't have those kind of things, right? We do that in our keli, far from the eyes of other people. In the church, we are one ma one mind and one heart. and we're, we're, we're following and commuting and praying together. All right, we're almost done. Let's talk about, about koliba, and then we're going to talk one more thing, and then we'll open it up to questions. So get your questions ready if you're interested in asking questions. Uh, wow, uh, we got a lot of questions. <laughs> I just checked out the questions over there, and we got 16 over there. All right, sounds good. We'll get to them in, in about five minutes, so hang on. Let's talk a little about Koliva. Everybody know about Koliva? I know some places don't do it, don't have it as much, only on, sequel, on so Saturday of the Souls, but in the Greek Orthodox, Athenite tradition, they have Koliva very often. Uh, could have it almost daily uh, in some places. Uh, so what is koliva? Koliva is a dish consisting of boiled wheat and other ingredients which are used in the Orthodox Church for commemorations of the reposed. What you see on the screen here are two different plates of koliva. One is from Mount Athos, and it has an icon that they've done with essentially food coloring. They've created this icon and this, there's a whole layer of, I guess, sugar. And then they have the image of the, the Apostle An Andrew, uh, which will, you know, this will be chopped up and the whole pan will be eaten by all the pilgrims. But it is food. It is koliva. Usually it's like what you see on the top left-hand corner. That's the kind of plate you'll see for memorial services and, you know, the commemoration of saints. Uh, Koliva is blessed during funerals and memorial services performed at various intervals after a person's repose. So the third, ninth, fortieth, one year, right? When we do all the memorial services, as well as on special occasions such as the Saturday of the Souls, Siko Savato in Greek. Uh, you know, we also have Koliva for the saints, and it's there's a prayer read. It's not the same thing at all, in the sense that we're not praying for the repose of the soul of the saints. The saints we have understood by God's revelation and by the faithful's, uh, you know, pious response 
and, and veneration, they are in God, and there's no need to pray for the repose of their soul. But the koliva is still, there's still koliva that's offered, like you say here, in, in commemoration of the saint. And there's a prayer read, and then that's distributed for consumption. And that's very common on Manathos on the feast days. So the 40 days, 48 martyrs of Sebastian, for instance, uh, at Siropotama Monastery, where I would go to those vigils every year uh, here in Lent, they have a beautiful plate with the 40 martyrs, 40, it's a very difficult icon they would have made uh, for the feast. All right, let's talk a little about history and symbolism of koliva. Koliva is derived from the classical Greek word kolivos, a small coin or a small gold weight. In the Hellenistic period, the neuter plural form of the word koliva took the meaning of small pies made of boiled wheat. Uh, we have, of course, this whole tradition beginning with the miracle of St. Theodore of Tyre. Koliva was introduced into the practice of the church after the miracle of the saint, which happened about 50 years after his repose. That would be in 360s, when Julian the Apostate was emperor. The apostate was wishing to mock the Christians, and he ordered the governor of Constantinople to sprinkle all the supplies in the food market with the blood sacrificed to idols. He wanted to mock them, see, look, you're eating the blood sacrificed to idols. He, did, he, of course, was doing this secretly, and he didn't want anybody to know, but he ordered the, the uh, governor to do this. And it happened to be the very first week of Great Lent. The emperor knew that the Christians would be hungry after the first week of strict fasting. In case you don't know, the tradition of the church going back even to the fourth century was that there would be a strict fast, no food whatsoever for the first three days, some places even the first five days, uh, but definitely the first three days. So Christians would be hungry and would go to the marketplaces of Constantinople on Saturday to buy food. So it looked like they were fasting all five days. St. Theodore, appearing in a dream of Archbishop Evdokios, of Constantinople, 360 to 70, commanded him to warn Christians not to buy anything from the market, but rather to eat boiled wheat with honey. Not long after this, the Feast of the Miracle of this great martyr, St. Theodore, was scheduled in the calendar on the first Saturday of Great Lent. So they, they, they had a special day shortly after that to commemorate him in this, in this miracle on the first Saturday. And to this day, we have that commemoration and that liturgy on Saturday. Uh, so that happened in 381 to 397, just 20 years later. From then until the day, on the first Saturday of the Great Lent, the remembrance of the dead and the commemoration of St. Theodore the Tyre are celebrated. The symbolic use of Koliva in our church services also shows that the man may also be regarded as a seed. So here's the symbolic interpretation, the theological spiritual interpretation, that we ourselves like a seed. The fruit of the earth is now sowing itself on the earth like wheat, go into the earth where die, the person dies, goes into the ground, right? To again be resurrected by the power of God, rising in the life to be and bringing himself alive and perfect in Christ. So that's the koliva is like a seed that goes into the ground and you have to die in order to rise. And this is the symbolism. For as any seed is buried in the earth, it will upon rising bring forth much fruit. It's also a human being over you know, the earth through death will rise again into eternal life. And St. Paul says something similar, showing the theme of the resurrection to the parable uh, of the sowing in the gospel. Now, here is a recipe. You can screenshot it, whatever you want to do. I'm not going to talk about it, but here's a recipe for koliva from the, Man the Manastirika, the, the, the website from the from a store of a, a friend of ours, uh, Nicholas Sapuris, who has a, has a store in... Uh, in Daphne on Manathos, and he is giving you a monastic recipe for koliva. Uh, so there you go. You can screenshot that and uh, uh, use it. Now, last topic for tonight before we open up the questions, and I this is a dear one to me, and I wanted to add it in here for all of our priests and anyone else who's going to be somehow involved in the baptism. How do we baptize babies? It's come down to this nowadays. We need to focus on this and teach this because, unfortunately, many are not doing it in the Orthodox manner. What does a baptism entail? It means immersion. The body of the infant, child, or adult, or whatever it is, is immersed fully. 
three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each time by an Orthodox priest and not sprinkled or water poured over the head. That's not how it's done in the patristic Orthodox way, right? Clement of Alexandria says famously, and he says much more, this is a very small quote, when we are baptized perfectly, we are illumined, illumined, we, are, we will be adopted, adopted, we will finish, and finished, we are immortal. Anyway, there's much more to the quote, I probably should give him the whole quote, but the point here is that it matters, it matters that we keep the proper baptism. Now, that's that's how you do a child. How, how about an adult? These are some of the pictures of how adults should be properly baptized. Down in the right-hand corner, you see the great missionary to Zaire, Cosmas of Gregorio, baptizing everyone there, and he baptized a lot of people. We're talking about almost, I think it was something like 9,000. It was thousands of people. In his, and it was a short stay, 10, 12 years, 15 years he was there. He's baptizing in the river, as is commanded uh, by the strict observation of the church, if possible. But also here from Africa, you see this, what they build in Africa. In Africa, the missionaries build proper baptismal fonts. In North America, in Australia, in Canada, in the UK, why can't we build and have proper baptismal fonts? Why is that not a priority in our parishes? Why can they do it in Africa, but we can't get it together? And there are many pictures of Africans being baptized in such a font in the form of a cross. One simply needs to search online, and they'll find several. And there's many more in the Greek language. I've seen them myself in the various journals. And that's how you baptize properly. Here is Father Eustine from Utah here on the left, baptizing in the middle of his parish there. He's got a huge horse trough. And that woman is going to be totally immersed. So you might say, well, Father, don't be legalistic. No, 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 no. You, you, if, you, if, if I said to you, well, let's do divine liturgy with some grape juice and crackers. And you said, no, 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 Father, that's not right. Would I, could I call you a legalist for insisting not to do that? No, I don't think so. You would say that's just the way it should be done. That's how the Lord wants it. And we should be faithful. Here's how not to baptize. Here's two examples of how not to baptize. And unfortunately, this is more and more common around the Orthodox world. We're baptizing like papal Protestants. We're abusing, distorting the mystery. And there are people who say it doesn't matter. It does matter. And God help you and all of us to observe patristic teaching. All right, there is a short uh, intense review uh, from about a thousand feet up of some of the basic, some of the more basic practical issues. I'm sure there are many more that we could cover, and you have many questions. So let's get to it, and let's uh, let's go to your questions. Now we'll start at the top of the list here. Uh, Byzantine ladybug, you mentioned last Tuesday that Orthodox Christian women should not not wear makeup. I don't wear a lot of makeup. I do wear a prescription tinted sunscreen. Could Father Peter elaborate on this statement? I realize this is a tiny issue, but I see women at church wearing makeup. Uh, yes. So um, the, the answer is fairly straightforward and simple. And I think you will receive this answer as I did. I've heard it from spiritual fathers and elders in my life, and I think it's fairly straightforward. One of our main enemies, if we're going to be united to Christ, is the what we call in Greek, Philastia, philastia, which means a love or a obsession or a, uh, a kind of a passion over ourselves, of ourselves. We love ourselves. We, we, we're constantly concerned about ourselves. We're thinking about ourselves. We're mindful of ourselves, right, in a sick way. And this is an obstacle to communion. When you have total self forgetfulness in a healthy way because you're focused on the person of Christ or your neighbor. That's when you can give yourself and your heart to the person and love them. If you're mindful of yourself, you are you're, you're in a way that's sick, you're obstructing that kind of devotion and attention and communion ultimately. So this is an enemy. And in all the patristic literature, St. John of the Ladder, that's the, one of the main enemies is 
And so when you're cuddling, cuddling yourself, when you're pampering yourself, when you're constantly concerned about yourself in excessive ways, there's many ways that this idea, there's many ways when this society feeds love of self. And so makeup is one of them. So that's a basic expression of philaftia, of love of self, excessively. And caring about what other people think is also not a spiritually mature, virtuous stance, right? Caring, what is the, what are they going to say about me? I want to look good. I want to impress them, right? It's not a spiritually beneficial. And saints don't do that. They're not mindful of themselves in that way. Also, there is a sense of, of correcting God, right? God gave us this body. He gave us this... Uh, this face, and we're going to make it pretty. It's not pretty, right? That's why we're putting makeup on, to make it pretty. But it is pretty. It is beautiful. God's made you beautiful. He's given you, he's given you what you need. Everything he does is good. So you don't need to improve on that. And it's an arrogant stance to say, I'm going to make it better. I'm going to make it more beautiful. It's ugly. So that's that is all all these things are an example of, of the sickness of the soul that needs to be corrected. So makeup is not a something you want to do. You want to slowly get rid of it. You want to distance yourself from it. You want to be simple, mindless in the good sense of your appearances and you look and moving for other people's praise and all the rest, which usually almost always goes along with these kinds of um, you know um, practices uh, focused on the exteriors. Focus on the superficial and not the essential and the spiritual. That's a short answer. If you read the patristic literature, you, they, they go on for pages and pages about the sickness of philaftia, which could be applied in many other ways. Like makeup is just one example. It just happens to be a more systemic problem in our society because there are, we're so focused on the externals and, may, and trying to impress people. Okay. Um, next question. Why do Orthodox Christian priests marry? I'm new and learning. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. So if you go back to the ancient church, you go back to the Apostle Peter, who was one of the two chiefs of the apostles, right? With Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter. And he, of course, is called upon by the papal Protestants as the great pope who supposedly uh, had a, a kind of supremacy over the others, which is a mistake. Uh, but it's interesting in the West that um, I think around the 900s, maybe earlier, they start to adopt this um, they start to adopt this idea that priests should be celibate and they have to be celibate to be priests. And so that is an innovation in the West that never was applied in the East. The Apostle Peter was married. And there's no reason to believe that he uh, dissed his, his wife and his children. He, certainly as an apostle, he had his calling and he left and he did the kind of apostle. But nobody disdained the marriage. Nobody has ever disdained the marriage. And many saints... Bishops, up until about the 5th century, maybe later, were married. St. Gregory the Theologian's father, of course, his father, a bishop, was married. So there are married saints who were bishops, not just priests. There are many, many saints who were priests and married and have been throughout the 2,000 years of Orthodox Christianity. So you have to be married before you're ordained. There's no blessing for somebody to get ordained and then go look for a wife. That's not possible in the Orthodox Church for good reasons, pastoral reasons. But if you're married, you can certainly become an Orthodox priest, and that's how it's always been. And the apostles themselves, some of them were married as well. So not a problem. It's a problem for Catholicism that they, uh, in a very undiscerning way, impose that upon every single person who would be a servant. Uh, not to say that it's not... In a, a, something that's desirable. St. Paul certainly thought it was desirable for someone not to have the the uh, 
concerns of, of, of marriage to serve Christ without that, but it cannot be imposed. And there's been uh, times when the church has said that in council and resisted that temptation. Unfortunately, Catholicism fell into it and has imposed it across the board. Uh, although they have now these various Byzantine slash Uniate uh, Eastern Right people who who obviously are married and they accept that, but the Latin right doesn't accept it. Next question: What should we be thinking, or how should we be praying as we light candles? Thank you, Alex, for your question. Uh, any prayer on behalf of our neighbor? That's usually why we're lighting candles. When we light, we take the candles and we go to light them. We're going to be usually the practice in the old country at least was you'd take maybe two candles or four candles and they'd have to be two for the reposed two for the living right and we might have specific people in mind uh we might just light two and then say a variety of prayers different practices different people but some people buy a whole bunch of the candles and they they have one person one candle and they pray for that person so usually that's the, it's an intercessory prayer but it could be for any issue at all uh, and it is, uh, like anything in the church, it's an offering to God, right? We have incense we offer to God. We have koliva. We have uh, artoplasia, the bread and wine, and oil. That's on big feast days. All these things are offerings, sacrifice for the love of God, for the glory of God, and for uh, the salvation of other people. So that's, it's, you can pray for anything you like, but that's usually what people are doing when they light their candle. Next question. Why do we have toll houses and theosis in our lifetimes if we are will be deemed worthy of it in heaven at the final judgment? Okay, you lost me on this question. Why do we have toll houses and theosis? Two different, totally different, different things. Toll houses are the temptations and the demons that will tempt those who have the soul is of the body and they're ascending, as it were, to heaven, right, to be judged. Uh, and there are demons on the path that are seeking to bring that soul into hell if it's given the rights, so to speak, spiritually. Uh, so that's toll houses is one thing. We could talk a whole night about toll houses and what it really means and how it's been distorted and why people are some people are opposed to it. In any case, then there's theosis, which of course is the aim of our life to be united, to become gods by grace. That's the point of the incarnation, the point of the church, the whole end of our life in Christ is to be totally united and restored. So totally two different things. And you say, if our, in our lifetimes, what does that mean in our lifetimes? I'm not sure what that means. If we will be deemed worthy of it in heaven at the final judgment. Well, if you don't enter in, why are we losing? There we go. If you don't enter into communion with God here, and make progress on the path of theosis, you won't have it eternally, right? If you do not love Christ and want to be with Christ and are not united to Christ before your soul leaves the body, then there's no basis to believe you will have that in the next life. So I'm not sure what you mean if you have it in these. Why do we have it in these this life if we're going to have it then? It's a continuum. We enter now into the kingdom of God. We enter now into communion. The whole aim of our life is to unite ourselves now and to have the kingdom is Christ himself in communion with Christ. is to be in the kingdom of heaven. If you enter into it before you repose, death becomes a doorway. You open up and you continue in that eternally. So it has to be here if it's going to be there. Those two things go together. Question about reading lives of martyrs to young children. The Synexarian can sometimes be gruesome in its descriptions of saints and sufferings. Should we avoid going into specifics when reading them to very young children to avoid scaring them? Or would this be disrespectful to the saint? Well, I think you need to use your discernment. You need to understand what kind of child you have before you, what the age is, how much they've understood, how much they can accept. Um, generally, I think you should give the spiritual meaning for sure, whether you're going to give every last aspect and description of the torture or something, that is going to depend on the age and the ability of the child you're dealing with. Some child are very sensitive, others don't have any problems. So it's going to be left to your discretion. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think you always have to read every line. I think you just need to be discerning. 
But you want to communicate that this the essentials of the story, right? Which was that they suffered for Christ, uh, that they they went through terrible trials, the patience, you know, you want to give them that for sure. Uh, you might summarize the gruesome parts a bit if you have a sensitive child or a very small child. Uh, but eventually, as they grow older, that should not be the case, right? Uh, if some, if, and it's ideal for you, for the children to be reading the lives of the saints as much as possible from ages, let's say, 6 to 10 or 6 to 12. Those are the years that they need to hear a lot about the saints. Actually, and I'm speaking for myself, we don't do enough of that. And that's a, that's a tragedy because we're really depriving our children of some great inspiration and deep and uh, deep meaning and deep teaching as to the, the whole point of this life. It comes through the lives of the saints. So as they grow older, I would say that the, the more and more of the description should be read, depending on their, their sensitivities. Uh, but I don't think it's a problem if you summarize uh, for those who, who you think are, that's, it's over the, you know, five-year-olds or something, obviously. You're going to be discerning on how you, what you say. Um, when I was a Protestant, I had, this is a question, I had, when I was a Protestant, I had so much joy knowing that I was going to heaven. Why are we Orthodox not as sure, not as less in certainty as the Protestants are? Well, I would say that the Protestants are in grave delusion uh, because they don't understand the nature of this struggle to the last breath. I mean, the Lord says very clearly those who are patient until the end will be saved. I'll just give you one example, right? Take The kingdom of heaven is taken by violence, and the violent take it by force. That doesn't go with, I'm already saved, once saved, always saved, I'm going to heaven, right? How do you reconcile that? It's obvious that there's a process. Salvation is a process. So this, this idea of the Protestant is actually tragic uh, because it's not based on anything. <laughs> be why? Of course Christ saved us. Of course, Christ is saving us, and of course, Christ will save us. The question is, are we going to let him? The question is, are we participating with his salvific offering? Are we assimilating the life of the kingdom? Are we growing in communion? Are we becoming solidified in communion? Are we getting closer and closer to theosis, which means a total uh, oneness with the will of God, a total uh, overcoming and trampling of the passions. I mean, this whole spiritual science and, and the whole soteriology of the fathers is absent in Protestantism. That's why they can stand and, and, and believe, oh, I've been saved, and I'm so happy that I'm saved. But actually, that's, that's delusional. Because the question is, what is salvation? I mean, they beg the question, what is salvation? Is it something that's imparted to us? We just Passively accepted? No, that's an illusion. Christ on the cross and in the resurrection and ascension, the whole economy of salvation, he saved every last human being, pious or not, from eternal death, meaning eternal separation from his body. Everyone will rise. And in that sense, everyone is saved. From what? Separation eternally of soul and body. No one will remain in the grave. That's salvation in one sense. But that's not resurrection unto life, right? Because the Lord says there are those who will be resurrected unto life and those who are resurrected unto judgment. So obviously we have to use our own free will to embrace his salvation and embrace the cross and embrace purification from the passions and hate the sin and all the rest that we could talk about for hours. The problem here is that there shouldn't be a self-satisfaction. That's that's demonic. Saint Anthony the Great, self-assurance, I should say, like I'm saved. No, he saved you from eternal death, separation of soul and body. Whether you will have a resurrection unto eternity depends on your embrace of that salvation, your assimilation of salvation. Saint Anthony the Great, who was the father of fathers, the the greatest of, of the ascetics, who every everyone in the world ran to and revered, is one of the great ascetics of all time, who clearly had, had been victorious over the passions and been freed of them through the miracles and all the rest that flowed from him. And yet, it says in the life, as his soul ascended into heaven and the demons came and 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 
and craftily told him, you have defeated us. He didn't say, yes, I've defeated you. What did he say? Not yet. And why did he say that? He never assumed anything, even as his soul was ascending to heaven. He never praised himself. He never assumed he was, uh, you know, in safety from pride, safety from falling from grace. So even then, in all humility, he didn't answer the crafty demons and say, and say, yes, yes, I, I, I've, I've defeated you. So you see, the whole problem here is the soteriology of the Protestants leads them to a delusion and to a false sense of security and, to not, and, and not understanding salvation as a continual assimilation, a continual carrying of the cross, a continual repentance. Repentance in Greek does not mean one time I feel, I feel bad, now I, or I, I, I changed my way and I embrace Christ. It's a continuous present in Greek, metanoite. It's continuous. It's a continuous orientation and a continuous simulation, a continuous uh, uh, ascent. So that's the problem. And God forbid that you feel this self-assurance and not feel that you have just begun. St. Sisoyas, the great ascetic, who all revered, he was faced with shine. And when they asked him as, as his soul was the body, Holy Father, a word, and he says, I, have, I pray that I can make a beginning in repentance. He's literally leaving this world, and he says, I hope I can make a beginning in repentance. So this is the great ascetic uh, witness of the saints with, with regard to this self-assurance self and and an idea that, well, I've arrived, and I'm there, and I don't need to repent. It's totally different ethos. Uh, the Rokor Parish question. The Rokor Parish near me is in all Slavonic, and the sermon is in Russian. However, the Antiochian one is in English. Does it matter if I don't understand the liturgy? Well, there's probably more to the question than just the language issue. So if you wanted to ask me and give me a full picture of what's going on, I could answer you. Just answering you on the question of language, I think it's important you know the language. Absolutely. I mean, the fathers, the Holy Fathers thought it was important that you knew, knew what was going on. They didn't write things in, in, a, in a secret language nobody knew. They didn't write things in, you know, Aramaic and, 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 and hope the Greeks just go along with it. Everything was written for the edification of the faithful. Everything was written for the catechism in their formation. We chant the services in their catechetical nature. They teach us as much as praise God. So, of course, it matters. But is that the only issue on the table? Are there other issues that, you're not, that also need to be considered? I think there are. I, don't, I can't answer that. And I can't answer. I'm not talking about the Antiochian jurisdiction or the Rokor jurisdiction. I'm talking about your personal you know, situation on the ground with your parish or whatever it might be. Those things, those are, there's much more to it than just to make a decision on the question of language alone. But as it pertains to language, of course we should understand what's going on in the church. That's ideal, and that's what we should shoot for. Might not be possible because of a variety of reasons. Might not be possible, and we need to be patient. That's also a possibility. It depends on the parish and what's going on. In my parish, some women cover their hair, and others don't. And even some of the women who cover their hair don't do it all the time. Why is this? Well, I have no idea why those women don't do whatever they're doing. I don't know why. I can't answer why they're doing that. It's, a, it's kind of curious. Uh, you think if they understand that they need to cover their head, they would always cover their head in church. So why they do it sometimes and others, that's a mystery to me too. I can't answer that. Do any Orthodox church besides monasteries offer daily or Vesper service? I absolutely love Vespers and would love to find a church that does it daily. I'm Antiochian and love my church but want more. There are parishes, they're probably rare, but I know of them that they do daily services in Greece and in America, but they are more rare for a variety of reasons. Some of them are justified and some of them are not. Some of them are just priests don't do their, their duty. Some of them that they really can't. They're working full-time jobs or whatever it might be. So it's really hard to say, but it's a wonderful thing to want to be in church. I hope you can find some place nearby I would say it's worth it to go to Vespers. If it's a parish that's not Antiochian and you're Antiochian, I don't see why any priest would say, don't go. They're Orthodox. They're in communion. We're all one church. You should go to Vespers. 
Next question. If you see someone crossing their legs in church, should you tell them? Yes, absolutely. How you should tell them is another question. Should you tell them? Yes. Now, you might say a variety of things might prevent you from telling them immediately. You might not have a very bold, you know, uh, ability to hold with them. You want to develop the relationship more. You might want to, you might consider a lot of things how you go about doing it. But that we should help one another to be and understand piety, that goes without saying. We're going to bear one another's burdens. We're going to pray for one another. And we're going to help one another. If the people have great amount of pride and refuse to listen to a brother who's, who's trying to bring in all humility and meekness, trying to help them, then you should be, you should remove yourself. I mean, not remove yourself like as a friend, but don't persist. Don't insist, right? You're not the priest to tell her she has to not do that. You're a brother in Christ that wants to help her on the narrow path. Be tactful, be discerning how you go about it. But the question of whether we should help one another to understand the proper way to be in the temple of God, absolutely. It, oftentimes, though, it takes a lot of wisdom how to go about to do that. And, and that's very important. It's as important as telling them the truth about something. Father Peter, could you talk about the practice of general confession we see in some Russian parishes right before communion versus having an in-depth, long confession with your spiritual father? Well, as has been shown in other texts written in previous days when that was more the case, I think if you go back to the 60s and 70s and 80s, my understanding is that this general confession phenomenon was even more the case and there were texts written in the, those times against this practice many people call upon the example of saint john of kronstadt for this practice but there are exceptions and it seems to me his was a justified one first of all he was a charismatukos he was a charismatic elder he had gifts that i certainly don't have so to me for me to say oh, i'm going to do what he did is rather undiscerning secondly he had a need. He had a great need. He had thousands of people that wanted to hear to, for him to hear the confession. So when he did do that, there was a grave need. And so pastorally, one could justify that. But he also would call out people in the crowd and say, you know, occasionally, you need to confess this. I mean, he had the gift from God. We don't have that. So his example is not a precedent for us. So I don't know if that's what people are doing, but that's not a precedent. So generally, it's been rejected as a general, uh, as a as a justified and good approach to the question of confession, a general confession. If we're talking about the general confession in the temple, where people are saying their sins, that's one thing. Now there are there is a tradition even on Athos, for at certain times the elder to read the prayer of absolution over the whole brotherhood. But where does that come from? That comes from the fact that the brotherhoods. The fathers are coming throughout the week to the elder and giving a, what's called in Greek, exagoripsi, a um, rev revelation, let's say, of thoughts and of, you know, of things that's going on in their spiritual life. So they're basically going several times a week to confess their sins. And so then at the end of the time on a Sunday, usually he'll read the prayer over the whole brotherhood. I think that's the origin of the Athenite practice. I don't think it's really a general confession in the same way that you're talking about. So maybe there's been a confusion there. I don't really know why and from where they're getting this idea that they should do general confessions when you could sit down with each spiritual son in most of these parishes, they're not that big, and you could confess them. Um, so I don't know why, if there's some massive uh, practical need, I, I, I would be surprised. But in any case, the ideal and the practice that I know is that you go to your spiritual father on a regular basis and confess to him, and this is the way the church has done it and does do it, and I think general confession is, um, I don't know, I don't know that much, but I would say that it's probably not, that it's not acceptable, uh, and is not practiced by most saints in our day. Uh, as a, let's see, question from keeping up with WD, whatever that is. As a, as a catechumen, do we confess every week, or a long confession prior to your baptism? Okay, so, as a catechumen, you don't go to confession on a regular basis. In my understanding and experience, I've never heard that happening, but you do make a long 
lifelong confession before baptism. And that is essential. And I've heard some places that doesn't happen. And that's not good. That needs to happen before baptism. And the prayer is read over you. And it's one of these interesting practices before baptism, which uh, is, is done in spite of the fact that the person is still to be initiated through baptism. And it's, uh, it's, it's done even for many people after baptism. There's lifelong confessions given uh, in different circumstances. So that's my understanding. Um, I, if you were to go every week to your spiritual father and to confess, I don't think that would be the pra practice that's done regularly. I don't know why they would, they would see that as uh, desirable or necessary. I mean, you can go and talk to them every week and talk about your passions. But to make it into a regular practice like you've already been baptized, I don't, think, I don't see that happening. My wife, my son, and myself, and thrown home and eat it throughout the week. That's very good. That's very ancient and, and good practice. My daughter has, re, has remained Catholic. Hmm. She also eats it as well. Well, I would say that it doesn't make any sense. I mean, she, you ask, is she bringing condemnation on herself? I would say the, the person at fault, if there's going to be a fault here, is the person who's orthodox and sharing it with her, unfortunately. And there's two reasons why I think it's a bad idea. And number one is this false sense of being already accepted as an Orthodox Christian and participating in things that only Orthodox Christians participate in. You heard me say earlier, anti doron, anti todoro, right? Instead of the gifts is for only those who could commune, but are not communing. So it's clearly not for somebody who's not in the church. So we're doing something that's not traditional, not practiced, and shouldn't be done. It doesn't make any sense because it's not for people who, who are not communing. Not for baptized. It's not, not for those who are not baptized, chrismated, communing in the church on a regular basis. So it, does, it doesn't help her, uh, I think, psychologically, spiritually, and it doesn't make any sense. So why is she doing it? Um, at, you should, and I think this should be a frank discussion. Why are you doing this? What, what do you think this is and why are you doing it? And do you... It, you know, you should, we would love for you to do this, but to be an Orthodox Christian. And that's that's what's presupposed here for the people who take Antidoron. Now, I know that's not practiced in a lot of places today, but there's no, there's no real theological, spiritual apology that I know of for a practice of giving Antidoron to non-Orthodox. I don't think there's much thought given to it. I think it's done out of some kind of hospitality or something, but spiritually, theologically, what is the justification? I don't think there is one. Uh, next question, should we uh, women only wear head coverings in church or technically are they meant for everyday life? Very good question. Thank you, Christina. So this is a difficult uh, one to answer because if you just go to the patristic text like St. John of uh, Chrysostom in his day, which I think it's a principle, in principle it's applied throughout church history. It's not something unique to his day. I mean, as I said to you earlier, people were wearing head coverings in the village in the 1950s and 60s, and still do in many places in Greece, older ladies still do it all throughout the day. They're very pious, you can find that. And uh, in fact, there's a couple of books out, uh, Ascetics in the World, I think it is, and you'll find some people, some women like this, uh, precisely like this. They lived very pious. They would wear their head coverings throughout the day, as was the common practice up until recently. So what I'm gonna tell you is not something unique to St. John Chrysostom's day. When he interprets this whole passage and he talks about the passage of, of the Apostle Paul, he does not make it only applicable in church. And that was common, common practice. So if I were to say, what is, do you want to follow what St. John Chrysostom says? Then yes, you could wear it throughout the day. Having said that, it's every good thing has to be done in a good way. And the question is today in our society, if you're working, for instance, at a corporation or you're working at a, as a nurse or you're working whatever, and your life is among all kinds of non-Orthodox, I think you could wear it. I mean, theoretically, you could, you could wear it. And it, it. Muslims wear it. Why couldn't the Orthodox wear it? But are you going to do it in a way that's going to be salvific? What do I mean by that? It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a ascetic struggle to wear a head covering throughout the day. People will mock you probably Orthodox Christians among the first, and they will be ironic about it, and you will have thoughts inside. You will be, you know, it'll be a struggle spiritually. And there's a danger that you could, that somebody could fall into pride and say that I'm special, I'm set aside, I'm set apart. Nobody, 
when you're the only one doing it in your community or your or your or your uh, work or whatever it might be in your family it it is a it is theoretically good but in practice it might be spiritually too much it might be too big of a struggle for you does that make sense i hope that makes sense i'm not i'm saying theoretically it's certainly possible it's praised by the saints in practice it's a something that will need a spiritual guide and you would have to, you know, come and, you know, talk about all your feelings and thoughts and all the rest to make sure that this is actually, even though it's externally and theoretically correct, in practice, it's not a practice. I mean, every ascetic practice, even though they're all theoretically good, may not be good for you. If I were to tell you, uh, you know, it's really ideal that you do 400 prostrations a night or 200 or 150 and you say, well, Father, I can only do 20. And I say, no, 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 you have to do 150. That would be extremely problematic, even though theoretically it's a good thing to do 150 brush races. So it's something similar in our day and age. I don't say that you can't, and I don't say that it's bad, but I would say that it might be an aesthetic struggle that's too much for some people in our day and age, and we need to be discerning about whether we can do it. I don't think that should apply to an Orthodox temple. I don't think there's any reason people should say, well, that same thing happens when I go to the temple. Then we're really stretching it here, and we're talking about a secularization of the church that, you know, God help us. In the temple, it's very common among the Orthodox around the world, outside of secularized West, to wear head coverings in church. And it's very much possible, and I think it's understandable. I don't think anybody should doubt that. But in life, daily, it's a bigger struggle. So you have to be up to the, up to, you know, to the struggle. Uh, Orthodox phronesis. I will keep names and specifics out of this. What do I do if a deacon's son came to Pascha in a dress? Prisoners were scandalized, and I've already consulted with the priest. Do I just leave it now? Well, um, First question, how much prayer and pain of heart have you expended for this deacon's son who is wearing a dress? That's the first thing. Secondly, have you gone to the spiritual fathers and priests and everybody, and what have they told you? If they've told you that they've already dealt with it, don't worry about it, then I would say for the time being, don't worry about it. If they said there's nothing we can do and it's perfectly fine, then I would say we got a problem, a serious problem. And, it, and it's indicative of things, worse things that are coming down the pike. And I would say that we need some spiritual heavy, heavy hitters to come in and help us. And maybe, a, maybe you need to, you know, go to other people and start to, I don't know. There's a, there's a variety of practical things you could do, but it's going to take a lot of discernment. If there's actually a defense of this or a rationalization of this and people think it's okay, then I, I think we've got a problem. I mean, this, it's, it's one thing for me in my room to engage in sinful activity and to embrace a vision of an anthropology or a, a, uh, an ethic which is unethical and unorthodox. I mean, I'm in delusion and I'm sinning and I need help, but it's another thing for me to take that public and enter the temple and, and to expect people to embrace that as perfectly normal. I think now we have a, a level of pride and a level of, of delusion that needs to be addressed. Like there needs to be, I mean, certainly at that point, we have an approach to the church and to the community, which is unacceptable and there needs to be correction. But I'm not the priest and you're not the priest. So it makes it difficult for the non-clergy who are in charge of the parish to do a lot of in you know direct intervention. What you need to do is to make it clear that this, if this is actually being defended, you need to make it clear to the priest that this is unacceptable, that you are not in agreement, and you need to um, you know keep it an, an issue that needs to be dealt with, not not um, put under the rug. Uh, but but the question of how precisely to deal with it, it's really a question of discernment. I can't speak to the specifics. I don't know the situation, but it needs to be dealt with if it's if it's being justified. Uh, if they Again, if they said, no, we've dealt with it, we've talked to them, it's not acceptable, then I would say go on and leave it. You know, you've done whatever you need to do. Pray for the person intensely. 
but you don't intervene in any way. I've seen also the Greek practice of not confessing to their parish priest, but only to the Yerod of a monastery. Is that proper or not? Um, in the Greek practice, in my experience in Marathos in, in northern Greece, where I lived for 20 years, uh, the choice of a spiritual father is not determined by anybody but the person. The pr parish priest does not get involved in directing the parish parishioners to go to this person or that person or to himself. And no one, no one supposes they could ever impose that on anyone. So I don't see any reason why someone could not go to a monastery, have a yeroda, and go to confession to them. The priest, unless there's some grave issue that's being, you know, not being dealt with, and it's affecting the community, then I then he should get a, get in the car and go talk to the elder or go talk to the bishop or something. But if the person just chose another spiritual father besides the parish priest, that's not a problem. I think the problem is when parish priests expect everybody to be their spiritual children. That's a problem. no basis for that, and it's not healthy. And nobody's going to do that. It's, you have to freely choose the person, right? I want to be his spiritual son. I, I, I'm, it's a very personal thing. And uh, people search for years to find their spiritual father. How could you ever impose that on anybody? Uh, Rita McDonald said, asked, where do I go to get a spiritual father? Well, you go to your parish priest, if that's a one possibility, of course, to another priest in the area, to a spiritual father at, from one of the monasteries in your area, somebody who's far away, it doesn't matter. I mean, I remember when I was looking as a new Orthodox Christian almost 30 years ago, and I was looking for my spiritual father, and I went to a, a wonderful a bishop that I revered, and I asked him to be my spiritual father, and he said no. And I thought, wow. What, what, what's wrong with me? Why, why can't I, what have I done? And he said, no, 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 it's, it's just that I'm, I'm not for you. And, I, and I, I, don't know, I don't know what information he got from above, but it turns out that that was true. And I found my spiritual father, you know, in Mount Athos. But, um, so but I was searching for a couple of years uh, to find a spiritual father. So it's not something that's, you know, automatic it doesn't you have to pray and ask god and search and visit visit uh monasteries that's often where people have their spiritual father in, in orthodox lands that's where people have their spiritual father they go to the monasteries in many cases i mean prayers priests are also spiritual father for sure but it is very common for people to want to go to a monastery and have their spiritual father so that's what we got to do we got to search we got to search and pray and ask god to reveal it and visit and um, find somebody who's following the Holy Fathers, who's on the narrow path, who's living what he's teaching. That's the kind of spiritual father you want. Don't go to just the parish priest because somebody said the parish priest has to be your spiritual father. That may or may not be the case, and nobody can impose that. So keep looking, pray, and, and, and ask God to reveal somebody who is on the narrow path. Um, doesn't have to be close to you. Not, and it's not likely it will be in, in many places in the Western world today, in English-speaking lands. So we might, might have to accept that we're going to see him once or twice or three times a year or whatever. And we'll have to write him letters and we'll have to call him up and things like that. That's, that's very, very likely the way things are today. Question from Uber, N00B. Okay. I was wondering, because I'm new to it, how does one select use myrrh oil at home? What significance does it have to my spiritual struggle? I use holy water, but I'm also interested in myrrh. Okay, so I'm not really sure which myrrh you're talking about. There's two possibilities here. The oil, you say. Um, we have oil that comes from oil lamps of the saints. We have oil that essentially is myrrh that comes from the weeping icons. We have oil that comes from the service, uh, the unction service, where the oil is blessed and administered for the, for, during the prayers over the sick. So I don't, I, which one are you referring to? It sounds like you're referring to maybe the myrrh that's coming out of the various work, wonder-working icons. And we put that on with our prayers when we have a special need, when we want uh, that we call upon the help of the mother of God, we call upon the help of the saint of which the oil is coming from, like Father Seraph from Roses, has oil of an oil lamp over his tomb, or Elder Frem here, people are taking oil from his oil lamp over his tomb, 
and there, you know, there, there's even on his tomb. There's actually even a uh, oil that you can take and dip, and you can apply. Uh, you know, uh, make a cross over your forehead. People do that regularly. So it's an extension of the veneration. It's an extension of the way we ask God to assist us. It's a physical like uh, manifestation of that prayer and that and that uh, uh, associated with that saint or that icon or whatever it might be. So uh, you apply it to your forehead and you uh, and you ask the prayers of the saint or the mother of God to assist you or God to have mercy on you, on you and enlighten you. Uh, so that's how you do that. It's pretty simple. Uh, do we conduct our prayer roll before divine liturgy on Sunday? Absolutely, except for the prostrations. Except for the prostrations, all right? No prostrations on Sunday. Everything else we do. Father, question from Napalm Platypus. I love these names. Where do people get these names? Father, it is, disrespect is it disrespectful to the cross to wear it during a workout or shower? Uh, no, I don't think it is. No. I don't see it as disrespectful. Unless it's going to be damaged, then it's disrespectful. But if you're just wearing it and you're doing your you know, business or your whatever, I don't think it's disrespectful. Now, you might want to take it off in the, from the shower just to protect it and not, you know, for whatever reason, that's fine. Uh, generally, show respect. Uh, if your conscience bothers you and you feel like you don't want to have it on when you work out or do it, take a shower, take it off. I don't see it as, you know, problematic. I think it, those things aren't sinful. You know, if they were sinful <laughs> or if they were disrespectful or immodest, then I would say yes, but I don't necessarily see that's the case. It depends. Uh, you'll have to examine your conscience and how you're doing the workout or whatever. Okay. Can we prostrate on Sunday in private prayer? No, we don't make prostrations on Sundays in private prayer. That's generally the rule that I know that I've been received and received from my spiritual fathers. On Sunday, we don't do prostrations. Some people might say, well, what about the 50 days between Pascha and Pentecost? We don't do them in services. That's There's witnesses to that in the patristic teaching. I don't know of any witness to say specifically we don't do them at home. But I know the opposite from spiritual fathers, including Elder Ephraim, when he would not want his monks going for a long period of time without prostrations because it becomes very difficult again after 40, 50 days without prostrations. First of all, you're opening yourself up to bad things because prostrations are very good for you spiritually. That let them go for 40, 50 days is not a good idea. In your private prayers, that's my understanding. There are people who say, no, you shouldn't do prostrations even at home during the Paschal season. I don't have that teaching. I do not receive that teaching from anybody, including Elder Ephraim. So I cannot embrace that. But I'm not going to say that it, you know, it doesn't exist in the church. Uh, just don't have it myself and don't see it as good, a good idea. Uh, what's the difference between the Sabbath and Sunday? So the Sabbath in the Old Testament was Saturday, right? It was the day that the Lord read his works. It was the last day. First, after the Sabbath, Sunday, is the day of our Lord and his resurrection. So that's the difference in a nutshell between the two. Why, why do we celebrate on different days than the Jews? Well, the Jews don't celebrate Christ and his resurrection. And, of course, that's the fulfillment of everything, ultimately, right? The resurrection from the dead is the trampling down of death, and it's the victory over the devil and death. And then it's... It's, it's confirmed, so to speak, in the in the ascension into heaven, when the, the body that rose from the grave is now seated at the right hand of the Father. So they won't celebrate the resurrection, obviously, because they don't believe in Christ, that he's the Christ. Uh, and you go on, I've heard Sunday is named after the sun god. Well, in English it is, but in Greek it's Kyriaki, which is the day of the Lord. Kyrios is Lord. Kyriaki is the day of the Lord. Right, so it's not named that in Greek, but in English, unfortunately, it was never changed from the pagan days before Christianity came. All right, next question. What is the Greek word for the healthy self-forgetfulness? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know if I can produce it for you on, on the spot here. Um, I don't know. Nothing comes to mind immediately, but I 
I don't know, amerimnesia, maybe, you know, not having merimnes, not having, that's not really applying to yourself though. So I don't know, that's a good question. I don't know if anybody else has an answer for that. There are any Greek speakers who remember? Nothing comes to mind right now for one term for that. Uh, weird question. I was taught many years ago, forgetfulness is a sin. For someone like me who had ADHD, it, does that still apply? Uh, so forgetfulness may be the result of a sinful lifestyle, may be the result of a, of a negligence, of a mindlessness, of uh, a lack of prayer, uh, a lack of, uh, um, you know, paying attention, focused, uh, respecting people, you know, I, I think it's I think it's uh, not a good thing, you know. If I meet somebody and then five minutes later I can't remember their name, that's not really a good thing, is it? It's so it's a missing of the mark in terms of brotherly love and mindfulness of my my neighbor. Uh, I can justify it as many people do. I'm forgetful, da da da. But I don't think it's a praiseworthy. I don't think it's a sign of regeneration. It's probably a sign of, of of a lack of love and a lack of attentiveness. Now, having said that, are there other reasons for forgetfulness? that are not caused by people's sinfulness? Yes, I think there probably is. There's a variety of physical ailments perhaps and all the rest, but I, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know what to tell you about that. But I would say there's two different ways that there could be sinfulness in terms of forgetfulness. One is just the general fall and the effects of the fall. And so in that sense, it's not regeneration. It's not theosis, right? God would can bring to bring to mind many things if we have a, a very tight communion with him and the mind is uh you know extremely uh, uh, connected to the grace of god the wonderful things can happen but so in a general way one could say yes it's a result of a of sin in other words a missing of the mark of a fallen humanity that's different than say that my personal sins have caused this and I don't think somebody who has, you know, who has some kind of ailment that, that that leads to forgetfulness for whatever reason, they shouldn't consider it a result of their personal sins. Does that make sense? It's one thing to generally, we have results of the fall all over society, right? But it's one thing for me to, through my own sins, to bring about this. That's a different thing. So one could one could definitely not have done that and have forgetfulness through the general state of society and ADHD could be the result of obviously factors that I, I didn't control or didn't want, right? Through um, inheritance of things or the environment. I heard a, in a talk by Bishop Morfu, Bishop, well, it's Bishop Neophytos of Morfu, that if you have fornicated, you cannot become a priest. Is this true? Uh, there is a canon in the church and a long tradition, and it's observed by good spiritual fathers, that if you are have been baptized, chrismated, and initiated into the life of the church, and then fall into the sin of fornication, you should not be made a priest. Yes, that is a common teaching of many spiritual fathers. Uh, if you if these sins happen before baptism, no, does not apply. Um, I mean, there are other aspects of this too we could talk about, but that's the basic answer. Um, there is a very minor view, I think, but does have some merit, but I don't think it's the major view of most spiritual fathers. And that is that the canon had in mind, <clears throat> the canon that forbids people who've fallen into fornication to become priests had in mind that we were in small communities and this sin would have been therefore known and therefore the the legitimacy, so to speak, or the the the, uh, the honor and the prestige, or the, I don't know the right word here in English, of the priest would have been damaged. So he could not become a guide to the community if they knew and it got out that he had fornicated and fallen into this grave sin. Basically, in other words, the canon has to do with the witness to the people of God. Now it's been undermined by this sinful attitude, this sinful uh, activity and lifestyle. 
And therefore, this priest cannot stand as a father of these people. He cannot stand to admonish them and to teach them. So in this interpretation, the main problem is the public witness. And so some might say, and I think this is the case in Russia, where they've done kind of a major economy uh, for many who uh, came out of communism. Uh, they were baptized perhaps as babies secretly. They didn't live the church's life at all. They didn't even have any catechism. They fell into fornication. Then when the church was legal, they wanted to become priests, and the bishops basically did a major economy and allowed them to become priests, which is, an under, is somewhat understandable in terms of the economy, but it is rather shocking that this could be a major like general amnesty that now becomes almost a rule. I think that there's some danger there, uh, but it's a very unique situation in Russia. I mean, frankly, I I would be, I, if I was asked back then, if I was a bishop in the Church of Russia, I would say, well, were they really baptized or were they sprinkled? Let's, let's go and baptize them. And that would be one solution because many of those cases, they were not properly baptized, right? I mean, it's very common in Russia for them to be sprinkled or to have a little water poured over them. They, the, the Latinization in terms of the understanding uh, in the Moscow Patriarchate uh, is my understanding is that it was pretty, it was pretty extensive. Uh, and also there was this major problem uh, when the, it became legalized, uh, the church became basically free again. They were baptized in mass, like hundreds of people, and they would literally sprinkle them. Again, not an orthodox practice in terms of baptism, but I'm getting off the topic here. So, so there's that minor view that, that, that basically the problem is the witness of the priest. And so if that is not known, or if that was never known, or if that was in some way totally not a part of the community where he's going to serve, then it's okay for him to become a priest. That's a minor view, though. And the vast majority of fathers I know say no. It has to do with the sin itself and the state of the person um, after this fall. And so, I mean, Elder Philothius Zervakos, for instance, says no, under no circumstances should people who fall into fornication after baptism be made priests, period. And he even says that something like, you know, if we run out of priests, then it's the end of the world, so be it. I mean, so there's there's kind of a, a fair, fairly, fairly strict stance in Greek uh, orthodoxy among the elders. Now, among others in authority, I think there's a general turning away from that patristic position. And so there are many who are, who, many I hear bishops saying, no problem, we'll make you a priest even if you have fallen into fornication. That's not the consensus of spiritual fathers and saints in my understanding. Next question, does EO, I guess that's Eastern Orthodoxy, believe Matthew 10.8? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the devils, freely give, receive, freely give. Is it a command that should be obeyed by all bishops? Well, which part of that is a command? Um, I mean, yes, he's saying you will do this because of the grace of God, and this will come out. Um, but it begs the question, is that something that's automatic because you're a bishop or priest or because they have the grace of God in abundance and by their prayers and all the rest? So uh, it should be it should be applied if one can and has that spiritual state. But not every priest and bishop have the gifts to cleanse lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Is that something that's applied de facto with ordination? No. I've never seen that anywhere in 2,000 years of Christian history that it can be applied de facto. In other words, it's the synergy of the man with the grace of God that brings it about. And the, the apostles were in that synergy. They were Pentecost and all the rest. They had, they had the presuppositions. It's not automatic. You can't make automatically someone into a miracle worker, right? So in that sense, when you say a command, if that's what you mean, that's not how things work in the spiritual life. Uh, is it potential for that? Absolutely. But one has to one has to work in synergy with the grace of God in their own life to become become worthy of that. It's not an automatic. It doesn't, it's not like with ordination comes miracle working. That doesn't happen. 
Uh, next question. Last week I visited St. John of Shanghai, San Francisco, but I didn't know how to pray to him. Does one properly pray to a saint? So what is prayer? It's communication. It's opening up the heart and, and, and communicating with God. So it, you're not praying to the saint as you pray to God. As In other words, it matters. <clears throat> it matters what you consider the, the person you're praying to to be. We don't consider St. John to be God. But in God, he's not God by nature, but he's in God by grace. Right? He's in the grace of God. He lives because God is not the God of the, li of the dead, but the living. Right? Everyone that is in God and lived in God and died and reposed as one in God continues in God. And so he, in God, he hears our prayers. In God, he prays for us. So you go to him and you ask him to pray. You beg him to help you. You, you know, uh, draw close to him as if he was walking on the face of the earth right now and you were speaking to him. That's how you approach him. And you just like you ask for your brothers and sisters to pray for you, you ask him to pray for you. And we call it praying to him, but not in the way we pray to God. It's not exactly the same way, right? It's obviously different antikima, uh, different uh, objects uh, of, of the prayer. But we do call it praying in the, in, in the use the same term, but not exactly the same meaning. I think that's how I want to answer that. Next question. In is nationalism, I think you want to say nationalism, a sin seen? Jesus always said his kingdom is not of this world. So I would say nationalism, if we're going to define it as loving your, your nation, your people, very close to patriotism, is not a sin. Ethnophilatism is the term we use in orthodoxy where we have a destruction of the proper hierarchy and we have an elevation of the earthly identity okay. above the, the worldly, uh, the uh, otherworldly identity. So we have, we have, I'm a Greek Orthodox, right? Greek first or second. In other words, there's a, there's a destruction of the proper order of understanding ourselves as pilgrims in this world. You can be a pilgrim in this world. You can be, you know, in, in this, this 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 valley of tears, you can be passing by and understand yourself and live for the eschaton and live for the next world and love your nature, nation, people, tribe. Those, those, two, those two, two things can coexist. As long as the hierarchy is proper, the hierarchy is right. So if you say, is ethnophilism a sin? Okay. Yes, it is, because it's putting the messing up the hierarchy and putting first our worldly identity. It's a secularization of the church, not unlike the other kinds of secularization. But if you say patriotism or nationalism, if that's what you mean by it, that's how I understand it usually, then I would say no, it's not a sin, as long as the hierarchy is maintained. Does that make sense? Now, if you want to say nationalism is ethnophilism, it's just, it's fine, but it's just, it's, how do we define our term? That's basically the question, right? Uh, Drew says, I've got a pentagram tattoo from my former life. Should I get it covered, remove it, or leave it? You should remove it. You should remove it as a sign that you reject that, as a sign of repentance, as a sign of cleansing, that you will have this, 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 this symbol carries with it some power. It, 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 even, in, even in your thoughts alone, it carries with it a power. You remember the past. And there was a time when you were beholden to this anti-Christ reality. And this symbolizes that. And so you should reject that, remove it, repent of it. And uh, that would be a good thing for you spiritually. Next question. Uh, Micaiah, Micaiah, is that, am I saying it right? Uh, thank you very much for the super chat. Very kind of you. God bless you. I've been Orthodox since 2018, still new to the faith. <clears throat> and I have a hard time with confession. I'm a combat veteran. I spent my adult years drinking and fornicating as a way to escape trauma. How do I confess? Am I really repenting of it uh, if I fall over and over? All right. So remember what we said? There's two parts to the whole path. To, to, to restoring ourselves to communion with God. It passes through repentance and confession. 
So first and foremost, we have to repent. Repent is not just remorse. It's mainly a reorientation of our whole life. So you have now reoriented yourself to a certain degree to being an Orthodox Christian. You need to continue that reorientation. You need to continue, and it's going to take violence against the old man. And if you were received, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say, if you were received by chrismation, well, as you know, as everybody should know by now, I think that's an error in this day and age. I don't think economy should be applied in the vast majority of cases because, as I've said many times, and I won't go into it, there's no presupposition for economy when the baptism has been so uh, undermined as, and it doesn't exist among the heterodox, either formally as a form, as an external thing, of course not essentially because mysteries don't exist outside of the church. So one issue might be, unless you were received by baptism, that that, is, uh, that, is a, that mistake is not going to assist you in your repentance. Uh, I'm just going on a limb there and say maybe you were received by chrismation, and that should be corrected. Maybe that's one of the reasons why you're having trouble not making progress. I don't know. Um, it, now, many people will say the economy is perfectly fine. There's no problem. And this idea that there needs to be the form, presuppositions. So therefore, you know, that's a bunch of nonsense, Father Peter's saying, because, hey, it's all the same. Okay, I disagree, but that's just one, one, one uh, you know, one person speaking. But I think that's what the saints say and our elders say. So consider that. Next the question is, how much on the path of repentance are we? What are we doing to remain on that? Are we helping ourselves or are we putting ourselves again in harm's way? Are we hating those circumstances that lead us to that sin? Uh, you know, are we going back again and again to the vomit? Um, if you're not actively praying, fasting, having a spiritual director, going to him often, it's very difficult to overcome those ingrained habits that we embraced with, you know, reckless re with reckless abandon of course it's going to be a struggle of course it's going to take time uh and so you but you need to have the full therapeutic program applied you've got to have the full 100 percent of the medicine given right so that's why i began with the question of baptism next spiritual father next fasting next or first of all prayer the jesus prayer this is a war against the passions and the old man and the devil who wants to keep you in, in, enslaved. So um, your path to health passes through deep and sincere reorientation, return, that's repentance, and confession. Why is confession so important? Because you've got to be humiliated to become humble. You've got to become, submit yourself to become obedient and like Christ. You've got to Expose your wound in order for it to be healed. You've got to be accountable and you've got to return and be accepted through the prayer of the priest, the representative, uh, so to speak, or the prosopos, so we say in Greek, of, uh, of God, of Christ. And he's going to restore you not only, let's say, directly to Christ, but to the community, to all the rest, right? Confession is the doorway to return to communion. And to be a, be one with the body of Christ and one with not just Christ, but the, everyone else in the body of Christ. So it's two steps, so to speak, but it, it presupposes the whole therapeutic program. If you rely on yourself and you don't take advantage of all the therapeutic methods, you will not overcome the old man. Impossible. You're too weak. We're all too weak. We have to have the grace of God. And that's how the grace of God comes to us when we go through the whole therapeutic program including confession. So confession is your ticket to health. Do not fear it. Expose yourself and you'll be healed. As long as you hide that, you don't give that over. You don't hate it. You don't, you don't, you're not willing to humiliate yourself. Well, that's pride. And that pride is going to obstruct you from, from having the strength to stand and not fall into fornication. Next question. My wife and I have chosen to not have kids because of my wife's physical and mental health. If I decide to become Orthodox, will this be an issue? Well, first of all, 
you will go to a spiritual father, you'll go to an elder ideally, and you'll submit that to him, and you'll ask his guidance. And he may give you a third way that you haven't considered. He, it may be that that'll happen and you'll continue on. How you live with that, again, is gonna be a spiritual father will have to guide you. What will you do? Voiding children and having sexual relations, it's a bit of a problem. And in terms of communing, right? You won't be able to commune often. Uh, so those two things don't go together. Now, if there's serious reasons, physical, mental, and all the rest, as you say, then there is, there's room for economy. But this is a discussion you have to have with a spiritual father. You have to go to an elder in one of the monasteries or somewhere and, and, and sit down and say, here's my situation. How should I live? How should I approach spiritual life, communion, and all the rest, given these things? And uh, it may be, though, that if with the help of God, with the grace of God, the grace of the mysteries and baptism and the spiritual guidance that your wife may get better. She might overcome any mental issues or physical issues. That's what happens in Christ. Miracles happen. People change. People have courage where they didn't have courage before. They had anxiety. Now they have courage because of the grace of God. And in God, wonderful things happen. But you've got to go with no preconditions, but seeking God's will and trusting him implicitly in the church and in the spiritual fathers. That's how people get healed and they're able to live differently, you know, and 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 um, have the blessings of the marriage, the full blessings. So I don't know what it is that's, but I can't really answer all of it because there's much more to the question, right? Much more to the situation than just yes or no. It's not, it's not a yes or no question here. Or answer. Okay, next question. Father Peter, can you explain to everyone that we do not refer to priests by their last name, Father Hears, but by their first Christian name? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's the tradition in the Orthodox Church, for sure. So, you know, Father George, Father Theodore, that's how we talk in Greek. We don't say Father Zesis, uh, Father Theodore Zesis. We don't say Father Zesis in Greek. We say Father Theodore. Um, in English, among Anglicans, I remember my father was an Anglican priest for 20 years. They do go by the last name, but in orthodoxy, we go by the first name. In fact, we also go by the first name for laymen. So they might say in English speaking countries, they might say, Mr. Johnson, it's actually in Greek, Kyrios, you know, if, if, if his first name was, you know, Mark, Kyrios Marcos, right? Mr. Mark is actually what we say. It's not just priest, it's also layman in Greek. Now, is it really bad that they call me Father Here is Not really. Not a huge problem, but it's not the way that the Orthodox do things usually. And I think it's, you know, preferable to keep the way the Orthodox do things than, than just adopt or whatever. Uh, next question. Mark says, should the word proud never be used in any situation outside as mean of the sin of pride? So something like, we're so proud of you, according to Orthodoxy. Um, you know, the context can, every word is malleable, right? Every word can have a double meaning, you know. Uh, but it is true that the vast, vast majority of times I've ever heard it in the, in the Greek language, it's negative. Uh, there are people who say, I'm proud of you in Greek, and they say, right? They say that, they use the term pride. And everybody knows they don't mean the sin of pride, but they mean that I'm really happy, I'm really enjoyed. No. Let's say something else though. Let's avoid that if we can. Let's say I'm very, I'm overjoyed for you. You've made me very happy. I mean, whatever. There's a thousand ways we can express ourselves and not be misunderstood possibly by saying I'm proud of you, right? Uh, so yes, I think it's, it's preferable to avoid it. If people use it in the right context, it probably won't be misunderstood, but it could be. And so it's better to avoid it. It's not a bad idea to avoid it. Can someone who has who was baptized in the Methodist church as a child be baptized again in the Orthodox church? I had no confession when I was baptized. No confession. <clears throat> well, as you may know, we have many videos on this platform, Orthodox Ethos, where we talk about the question of reception of converts in the Orthodox church and how that needs to be by baptism. So the, the norm, the akrivia, the exactitude of the church, especially when, it's, when we're talking about uh, all of these various heterodox confessions who have abandoned the form of, of, of the mystery, 
not now, but hundreds and hundreds of years, the West has abandoned immersion as the way of baptism. That's what the word means. Baptism means immersion. So just to begin with, you weren't really baptized as a, as a Methodist because they don't immerse. And if you were immersed, you're a great exception among the Protestants of the Methodists. The vast majority of them do what the Papists do, the Papal Protestants do, and they pour a little war, water over your forehead if you're a baby. So that's not baptism. Baptism literally means immersion. It means to plunge, be plunged in the water. You saw the images I showed you, the way that one should be baptized. That's not insignificant or unessential. It's tied to the theology of the mystery. It's essential for the mystery to be done in that way, for the symbolism to be present and the meaning to be present. We do damage and we do harm to our own understanding of the mystery when we allow for sprinkling and pouring over the head. It's not what the church ever does. Not, it doesn't make any sense to do those practices and to talk about regeneration, death, and resurrection. That, that, that's not what's shown forth. Even Aquinas admitted that. Aquinas said that's that does not, it's not expressed in these other forms. And then he says, but it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter to the Orthodox. It matters to the Orthodox. We care. We want the way the apostles and the Lord taught us and the fathers did for 2,000 years. We don't want to depart from that. We're undermining the whole thing when we accept such ideas, such pe people in the church, like Methodists, even Baptists are only baptized with one immersion. It's a departure from the form. We do damage to the mystery and to the whole understanding of, uh, of, the, of the mystery of baptism and the people's life in Christ. When we ignore these things and receive them and call that baptism, when it's not, it's, it's not baptism. So of course you can be baptized as an Orthodox Christian if you've been sprinkled or poured upon as a Methodist. Neither the form nor the spirit of God is was present in the Methodist uh, so-called baptism. Orthodox phronesis asks, again, I think, second time, if we were told not to do a lifelong confession because the baptism cleansed it, us of our sins, should we still bring a lifelong confession to the priest? So I will just have to answer you with the words of Elder Cleopa of Romania. Of course, you can go to life confession and multiple times. And he encouraged people to do it multiple times. And he saw the benefit for self-knowledge, aftonosia, in a life confession. And it, it helped people to understand what they were, who they were, what they've become, the, the, for the spiritual father to understand better the ailments, the spiritual ailments. Life confession before baptism is the norm, and it can happen after baptism if the priest and the spiritual father, uh, you know, bless it and accept it. We have saints in our day who certainly bought, believe that that was a good thing. Another question, what advice would you give to someone who will be ordained a priest soon? Wow, are we actually at Three hours and 27 minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed how quickly this live stream is gone. Unbelievable. This is blue, blue, blue through a lot of questions. God bless you all for your questions. It's good. I think we're helping a lot of people out there who have similar questions. So what would I give advice for someone who's going to be ordained to the priesthood? Well, <clears throat> my main advice, generally speaking, as I've said on previous occasions, is if you are going, it's very good to become a priest and to, and, to, uh, and to serve the church. If you have a blessing of a spiritual father, you don't have any obstacles to the priesthood, you're prepared to be crucified by the world and by your own parishioners and their passions. But I would say, You've got to be ready and be determined to stay faithful and confess the faith in the in 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 the midst of these temptations and against the various isms of our day: humanism, philatism, secularism, uh, you know, formalism, or whatever you know, these various isms that are that are affecting the church. You've got to be prepared to be martyred, to be confessor, to be rejected. Uh, make a decision that that's what I'm going to do. That's the role of the priest. It's not 
going to be easy. It's not going to be, I'm not going to compromise for the sake uh, of, uh, of making uh, secular worldly people happy. Now, is there room for discernment? Always. Is there room for a, you know, uh, retreating to the mountains at times and then coming back again uh, to the field of martyrdom? Yes. With a good spiritual guide, you'll discern when that is and when it's not. But do not enter the priesthood today without a stark understanding of what we're facing and, uh, and a preparation to be crucified and to be rejected even by those in the church. And that's the reality that we have today. We have, we're in a time that's not unlike the, the time of iconoclasm or the time when Arianism ruled. We have the rulers of this world and many of those bishops who unfortunately serve those rulers who are making, uh, uh, imposing upon the people of God a strange and foreign mindset and heretical doctrines many, in many cases. So in that context, in, that, in, that, in, in this setting, a priest who's going to save his soul is going to be one who's persecuted, not one who has it easy, not one who avoids conflict, right? So that's the main thing. If you, do, if you enter the priesthood today, it's a good thing, but don't enter it without a sober mind about what it means to be a priest today and be prepared to make the sacrifices. And it might mean that you're going to be shoveled around to different parishes. It might mean that you're going to be, I don't know, suspended one day. God help us. But if we confess the faith today and we stand against the isms, we will not be popular with certain people in the church. And some of them are very powerful. And that's just the way it is. So that would be the main advice. The other thing I would say is prepare yourself for the ordination. Just like somebody prepares themselves for baptism, there's a process to prepare yourself before ordination. Fasting before the ordination a few days, intensified prayer, uh, uh, setting aside uh, as much as possible leading up to ordination, you know, things that are going to be distractions, worldly pursuits. Don't justify yourself and say, oh, well, before I'm ordained, let's go do this, you know, worldly activity and things like that. Uh, that's not a good way to prepare. Everything you do matters. Every little preparation, every little prayer, every little fast, every little prostration, every, you know, crying out from your heart, all of it matters. And it helps you to become a better priest and have a, have the, a participation in the mystery of the ordination more intensely, which will then aid you to be a better priest, right? It's all connected. Uh, do not look at it legalistically or superficially, but look at it essentially. That you're before the throne of God. You are going to petition before the throne of God for the souls and salvation of your flock. And that, that, that means you need to be, uh, to have a certain boldness, you know, in prayer, which means you're going to have to have an ascetic life and a fasting and prayer life that's going to be able to allow you that. You know, you're not going to stand bold if you're living uh, in, a, in a worldly way and, and, you know, continuing a life that is fun and easy and blah, blah, blah. Right. That's not, not that's not going to ennoble you, embolden you to be able to intercede for the faithful uh, and their salvation. Next question. I know somebody who has walked away from the faith. It has been a few years now. Ever since then, he has been going through a lot of internal difficulties, which seem to get worse each month. Advice. Well, the advice has to be come back to your first love. Repent. You need to be honest with him. This is all related. There's nothing an accident in life. Nothing is meaningless. Nothing is unconnected to the question of salvation. Everything is in God allows or he wills. If you're wise and you're humble, you'll see all these things as God's way of allowing you to fall and hit your head and, and break your face so that you wake up and come back to him. Nothing's an accident. Nothing's, nothing's irrelevant. So I would be very, if I had the boldness and he allowed me to tell him, I would tell him straight out what he needs to hear. Next question, I think it's the last one from our brothers and sisters uh, on YouTube and Facebook. Are we allowed to eat food other than prosphora inside church buildings? Thank you for the question. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, no, I would say that when, it's not a question of allowing. It's a question of is that a pious thing to do? 
Now, occasionally there are special circumstances where that might happen, but generally the only thing that I've ever seen people consume in the church building, at the back of the church building, I mean, besides Holy Communion, obviously, is holy water, koliva, artoclesia. All right, things that are blessed in the temple can be consumed in the narthics or the exonarthics or the back of the church. Otherwise, why would you sit in the church and eat food? On what basis and why? It doesn't seem to be a place for that. It doesn't seem to be a pious thing to do. I think it's problematic. All right, we are done with those questions. We have 21 other questions over at Crowdcast, but it's already three hours and 40 minutes. So we're going to have to postpone those questions to Thursday. All of you who have asked questions in Crowdcast, thank you very much. We will get to your questions coming up this Thursday. So come back and be with us on Thursday. Uh, if not, you can always jump in and, and find them. You know, it's very easy. It's the great thing about Crowdcast and our question and answer sessions is that you don't have to come back and listen to all the questions to try to find yours. You can go right to the question, hit the button, and it takes you to my answer. And that's a great thing. You can find hundreds and hundreds of answers over the last two years through the Crowdcast uh, platform. Uh, and so, you know, for what it's worth, if you've got a lot of questions and you want them answered, join our Crowdcast platform, our Patreon pa platform, and then go back and just go down the list of questions, hit the button, and, and you can hear your answer, or at least some attempt at an answer based on our church experience. God bless you. Thank you for your participation tonight. I hope it's been beneficial and helpful for all of you. I look forward to your comments on social media. I look forward to you coming over and joining us on Patreon and generally uh, spread the word and all the rest, you know, you know, the usual stick. Thank you very much. God bless. Uh, we'll uh, um, see you on Tuesday for our next installment of um, the Book of Revelation. We're on number lesson 11. And we're getting into the middle of the second chapter. And I look forward to see you on Tuesday for that, all of you who are following us uh, for the Book of Revelation. Otherwise, Thursday night, question and answer. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Good struggles. God be with you. Oh, my God.